All right. So environmental emergencies is going to cover a wide variety of information. We're going to look at hyper hypothermia, you know, heat and cold related emergencies, uh, swimming, uh, drowning, um, and the, as well as scuba diving related emergencies, high altitude mountain sickness, and then envenomation bite stings, things like that. Uh, normally we think of those as an allergic reaction, but instead, <clears throat> Instead of focusing on the allergic reaction aspects of stings, we're going to be looking at the envenomations and the issues related to that. Um, while this is a national curriculum and it is designed for people um, across the country, some of the topics may be less of a concern or a likelihood in your area. However, there's... Um, no telling where your career will take you and where you will end up. So it is all relevant information and it's all very um, <clears throat> fair game on the National Registry test. So just because you live in Savannah doesn't mean you shouldn't ig uh, you should ignore the high altitude um, concerns. And just because you live in northern Mississippi doesn't mean you should ignore the uh, scuba diving. Um, concerns because these can happen in any area as we'll see here in a little bit as some of the concerns actually are more likely to be seen when you're uh, not in the immediate scuba diving uh, community area or area where the people were scuba diving so all right uh, here's a picture of a bunch of crazy people um, deciding to do a polar plunge of some sort or something like that <clears throat> Of course, it's winter time, so we're starting to see a little bit more of the winter weather. I think it's important for us to remember the difference between somebody being cold and somebody who's actually having a cold-related um, emergency or concern. Um, also, uh, we'll, we will talk a little about how some of these concerns can be, um, or not concerns, some of these conditions can be impacted by air medical transport and thing, uh, things along those lines. <clears throat> All right, well, like with anything, um, these are pretty much always our common risk factors. It seems like any, not necessarily injury, but any type of incident that could happen to somebody, pre-existing conditions, diabetes and cardiac specifically, always put us at greater risk of those, uh, or at least um, the condition. Somebody remind me why that is. Why do diabetes and cardiac disease always end up on the pre-existing conditions list or uh, factors that predispose people to problems. What is it about those conditions, those diseases that um, predispose us to issues? <clears throat> Somebody, anybody? Casey, is that you down in uh, Savannah, all alone by yourself? Yeah, tell me about, well, tell me about this. What, why, what is it about diabetes that cause that ends up being a uh, predisposing factor? I can. Why is diabetes a predisposing factor or a condition that puts us at an increased risk of whether it's environmental emergencies or good grief, it feels like every other con, uh, con major area of concern? What do you remember about diabetes? Yep. Easily, 
Absolutely. So the yep. So that that is correct. Uh, the neuropathy will has a decrease in sensation. What are other maybe somebody else? What's another major issue uh, related to diabetes that's not the same as neuropathy, but caused the same way? So di um, neuropathy is a big concern. They have a decreased sensation. They don't realize they're hot. They don't realize they're cold, or or um, they don't realize they're experience exposing themselves to trauma or something like that. So what's something else? What's another aspect of diabetes? There you go. So as well as the neuropathy, you have the poor peripheral circulation, the microvascular um, break, the breakdown of the microvasculature. And so what that's going to do is reduce the ability for the patient to heal, but also to reduce their ability to get rid of heat or to uh, retain heat or to um, respond or um, compensate dur due to blood loss or something like that. So those are big issues related to diabetes. Now, um, Conyers, talk to me about cardiac disease. Why does cardiac disease pre um, predispose us to so many concerns? So if we have a weakened pump, we're not going to be able to compensate. So like what, and, and we'll see as we go on how our body's going to respond to various things. But the big issue here is that inability to change or adapt to the new environment. All right. Younger and older people, when we're talking younger, we're talking like babies, like really young. Um, and then of course, you know, dehydration, fitness, all that kind of stuff plays a big role in it. We understand that, I hope. All right, homeostasis as a reminder back from the AMP and patho section, right? Homeostasis is that ability to balance, that ability to um, maintain regulation within our body. It's that constant uh, ebb and flow or um, increase and decrease of systems that keeps us in a very narrow window of... Um, of balance, uh, whether that's for blood pressure, heart rate, body temperature, um, metabolism, so many different things regulated or uh, connected with that. And then thermoregulation, this is a term we're gonna see here are relating to both heat and cold emergencies, but this is our brain determining what our body temperature should be and then reacting or responding appropriately to alter that temperature when environmental uh, factors or um, internal or external factors start impacting it. So um, interesting kind of related to thermoregulation since a lot of us are being, been dealing with illness lately, we've all probably felt a fever. What is the symptom that you feel what, what, what is the first thing that you really feel when that fever starts? What, what tells you I have a fever? Do what? Well, right, the people feel warm skin, like you touch it, the person, the patient, their skin feels warm, but if you're the one with the fever, what are you gonna feel? Yeah, yeah, you feel cold. So you feel, you're feeling cold, you're sitting there shivering, and then somebody comes up and takes your temperature, and your temperature is like 102, and you're shivering. Why is that? That is because here in the anterior hypothalamus, your body, your brain has decided that instead of needing a temperature of 98.6, it needs a temperature of 103 and in order to fight the infection that you have. And... So why are you feeling cold? Why are you shivering? Because your body has been reset to needing a temperature of 103, your temperature's 101, 102, whatever it is. And so your body is going to try to increase your body temp until it gets to that 103, at which point you'll stop shivering. And that is why we feel cold. That's thermogenesis. That's why we're trying to produce um, more heat. That's why we're bundling up with blankets and all that kind of stuff. And then we feel cold. And then as our body, or excuse me, as our fever breaks, the fever goes away and then our hypothalamus 
resets back down to that 98.6 or whatever the normal appropriate, you know, appropriate uh, temperature for us is, then we start sweating up heavily um, as we're trying to remove that heat from our body and trying to return to that normal sensation. Now, why do we take things like Tylenol or ibuprofen when we have a fever? <clears throat> what do those what do those uh, medications do? They alter, you know, they block the prostaglandins and the inflammatory response system that told the hypothalamus to increase the temperature. So they prevent they don't they don't actually affect the hypothalamus. They prevent the chemical messengers within the body from telling the brain that it needs to have an infection. So the brain's like, oh, well, we're, we're not getting any signals, so we're going to go back down to normal temperature. And that's why our temperature drops when we have, um, when we take those medications. Those medications don't actually fix the problem. They don't remove the virus. They don't remove the bacteria. They don't rem remove the, the cause of the inflammation. They just remove the response of the inflammation, which is... You know, it's a mixed bag of nuts, I guess you could say, because it's you feel a little bit better, but your body's not fighting the infection. And so we'll see that kind of stuff here as we go. All right. Well, I mentioned it already, 98.6, um, which if I'm remembering correctly, relates to 37 degrees Celsius um, is a normal body temperature. And then here's some other terms. What is... How do we determine if a patient has hypothermia or hyperthermia? 104, excuse me, 100.4 is hyperthermia. Anytime their body temp is above that, we're going to consider them a heat-related hyper, hyperthermic problem. And 95 is the cutoff for hypothermia. Above 95, you know, 95.8, 96 uh, Fahrenheit, these are still considered, while they're low, they're not considered hypothermic. Um, I think it's interesting to note that the, the difference between normal temp and hypothermia is much larger than the normal temp and hyperthermia. Our body does not handle high temperatures very well. Hence, when we have the fever, we feel like um, total crap. Or as somebody sent me an email this morning, uh, wake woke up feeling like dog poo. All right. Yes, our oral temp can be significantly different than our core, as you can see, especially when a person's ill or if the person has been out in a um, cold weather environment or something like that. If they're breathing heavily, breathing in and out cold air, their mouth is going to be a lot cool colder. So oral temp um, measurements are not the best for what we, uh, when we're trying to determine uh, core body temp, but at the same time, we do not need a rectal temperature. Um, while that may be the most reliable, it is not necessary. Uh, it is not necessary to be that specific. Um, tympanic or temporal, they tend to work really well axillary it can be okay but it's a very or it can be a little bit more cumbersome of a temperature reading simply uh, especially when dealing with cold weather emergencies or something like that um, your uh, tympanics are probably your better choice there um, I mean unless you just really want to do rectals and yeah sure go ahead uh, try explaining that to your patient and oh, by the way, does anybody know the difference? Uh, what's the difference between uh, the oral thermometers and the rectal thermometers like they have at the er, at the hospital where they separate the two? Uh, what's the what's the difference between the two thermometers? You're right. But uh, yeah, they have the different colors on them and then they put the little uh, thermometer condom thing on it. And it's like, I don't know what the problem is. You know, you put the little plastic sleeve over it, you know. We're not reusing the plastic sleeves. All right, we mentioned hypothalamus, kind of already talked through this. So when we're trying to do... Th uh, Okay, what are 
uh, the two ter terminologies. We talked about these back in the AMP and patho units. So what are the two terminologies related to thermoregulation? As our body is trying to create heat or relieve heat, there are two words that we use to describe that. The, the actions that you can see here in this slide, these are, these are what causes them, uh, or I mean, these are what facilitate the, the production of heat and or the removal of heat. So what, what are the words that we're looking, what, that I'm looking for here? Do what? Well, vasoconstriction is going to be a big part of your uh, producing heat and retaining heat. Uh, but that wasn't the word I was looking for. It's the word that describes the entire process of retaining heat and producing heat. Frankie, y'all there in Roswell, you got what you got for me. Okay, those are only a small part of it. Do what? Okay, good thought. Um, I like where you're heading. That that is the pro that is a method of heat removal. As air passes over the body, it pulls the heat off of the body. That's convective cooling. That that is a or heating. You can do the same thing. So, but that wasn't a word. What I was looking for were thermogenesis is the word used to describe the production of heat in our body. So shivering and uh, vasoconstriction and such like that. And then thermolysis, the removal of heat from the body. That's vasodilation, uh, sweating, um, su such along, uh, along those lines. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So... If thermogenesis creates shivering, what is shivering? What do we know about shivering? <sighs> yeah, we do it when we're cold. What is it? What is it we're doing? <laughs> okay, yes. Um, yes. And it is accomplished by contracting and re con, um, repetitively contracting and relaxing opposing muscles. That's why we shake. That's why our body is moving because the opposing muscle groups are, con are um, contracting and relaxing, contracting and relaxing. And why? why? Why is this creating heat? What are we doing? We are increasing our metabolism. We are increasing our consumption of ATP. And as the ATP is split, through that muscle contraction and all that, heat or energy is released. So the process of shivering is going to produce or um, consume a lot of energy. It's um, going to use up oxygen. It's going to produce more CO2. It's going to use up glucose, which is why with the very young and the very old, it's really important that we take uh, note of the patient's glucose levels, monitor their glucose levels when they have a fever and when they're sh or when they've been really cold and they're, they're shivering because especially little kids, uh, babies, they can burn through their uh, glucose stores really quick trying to uh, maintain that body heat. <laughs> That is a low core temp. Did he what, did he get rained on? I didn't catch. Yeah. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah. That's That is a significantly low core body temp. Um all right. Huh. Um, well, I can't say I've seen that happen before, honestly. Um, 
I'm wondering if that's just kind of like a uh, an attempt to produce heat. You know, kind of like a instead of shivering that react uh, contraction rea- relaxation. If it was just a constant contraction, more or less. So BMR, um, not don't really get too hung up on it, but uh, or that's that's really not a formula you need to get too. Sh- worried about but it kind of gives you an idea 70 kilocalories an hour is normally what a 70 kilogram or one kilocalorie per kilogram um, is what your BMR is going to average of course this is going to assume a normal BMI and no other underlying medical conditions or illnesses or anything like that Um, but of course when illnesses or other issues are added into the system this explains why the BMR um, will increase. Um, So here you can see number of calories recommended due to that BMR, how much are we going to use um, energy wise just to function throughout the day. This is one of the big reasons we lose weight when we're sick is our uh, BMR is actually going up. Uh, We're burning more energy. Um, we're trying to maintain that body temperature. This is why patients who have a fever breathe faster because they're exhaling that CO2. They, they're producing through the um, uh, shivering and all that more. And then, <clears throat> but when you're ill, you don't have a appetite. You don't really want to eat. So yeah, um, after you get better, you tend to be pretty hungry because you're trying to uh, make up for all that lost energy. Oops. Went too fast on you there. Um, all right. <coughs> kind of already went over this, right? Heat generated glycolysis, glycogen breakdown, uh, the whole um, ATP production. So moving through here. We talked about this earlier. You know, vasoconstriction, vasodilation. Body vasoconstricts to shunt blood to the core in order to stop the loss of heat. Uh, when in a cold environment or the body vasodilates shunting blood to the peripherals to try to um, dissipate the heat to pump more heat out of the core into the peripherals so that heat can be removed through evaporative or convective cooling now um, what is a major concern related to that what if you think thinking about a patient who's trying to vasodilate at shunt in order to get rid of or moving blood to the peripheral in order to get rid of heat what is something that they are at increased risk for what you got for me they're vasodilating, their blood's all pumping to their skin, they're trying to sweat, they're trying to remove all that body heat. What what does this put them at an increased uh, risk of? Hmm? It, it's... It's a relative shock because it creates what's called a relative hypovolemia. You've made the container larger. You haven't added new blood. So now their body appears to be in shock. And so they are at risk of um, syncope or and orthostatic hypotension. So they better not sit up too fast. All right. Uh, so thermolysis production of heat kind of already went over this kind of stuff so we'll move on and this was brought up already cooling if we're trying to remove heat from our body radiation um, radiative uh, cooling is uh, not not something that we do a whole lot of. Yes, our body radiates heat, but um, it's not one of the major methods that we use or a very com- um, significant method that we use for cooling our body. Uh, convection and evaporation really are the more likely we sweat. The sweat is evaporated. It pulls heat with it. And then conductive or convective cooling. Uh, conductive, we see that a lot. Uh, your example, uh, was that you, Ashley? No. Who, who was it that suggested... Or I was telling the story about the um, homeless guy. He was soaking wet. 
uh, the water uh, being against the skin conducts heat away from the body faster. So that's an example of conduct conductive cooling, and it cools you quicker than convective cooling, where air. And this is why one, if you're ever you know in a wilderness cold environment or whatever, and you fall in the water, your clothes get wet. You're actually better off to be naked and dry in cold weather than you are to be clothed and soaking wet in cold weather. Some of our more modern clothing technology, though it doesn't uh, isn't a big concern because the water the clothing sheds the water pretty quick. Different issue here, but in general, dry and exposed to 32 degrees is better than wet and expo uh, clothed um, with 32 in 32 degrees. <clears throat> and we've already talked about thermogenesis and the production of heat and how that works. Why do you think the thyroid levels go up? Why is there an increase in thyroid when our body is trying to produce heat? Bingo. Absolutely. Good job. Thyroid, thyroxine is the hormone that regulates our metabolism. So when our body says we need to produce more heat, it does that by increasing metabolism, which means more thyroid levels are available. So what does this tell us? What other conditions have we read about uh, recently that would perhaps put a person at an increased risk of hypothermia? Yeah, if a person doesn't have an adequately functioning thyroid, they're not going to be able to respond to the heat as well. And so they're going to be more likely to suffer from hypothermia than uh, an otherwise healthy individual. All right, so that kind of covers a little of the basic uh, functions and concepts related to um, heat at production and uh, thermogenesis, thermolysis. Now we're going to get into more of the specific heat-related emergencies. Before we do that, let's take a quick break. Okay, so heat illness. Um, heat illnesses and heat-related emergencies are going to be com combined into three levels or three major groupings of conditions that we're going to have to deal with. So. As a whole, heat illness is when our body temp is increasing and we are not able to remove that body heat from us. So here in the Southeast, this is a very common issue. It gets hot in the summer and it's very humid. Our body is supposed to sweat, the sweat is supposed to evaporate, and that is supposed to cool us off. But anytime the relative humidity is above about 65%, obviously the higher the worse, um, but anytime it's about 65% or above relative humidity, sweating is no longer an effective means of um, cooling. Hence, we refer to things like swamp butt and such like that because we're just sticky, sweaty, and wet, but we're not actually cooling off. Um, so uh, let's look at some of these conditions. Uh, who's at risk? Yep. Why are older people at risk? Well, they perspire. Why do they perspire less? Because of decreased sensation, decreased blood flow to the skin, um, decreased neural control and hormone regulation. They acclimatize slowly. This is due to the brain receptors not processing the incre the all changes in their body as fast. Doesn't mean that they can't. It's not related to a disease process. It's just the normal degradation of synaptic processes and cognitive function that we see. It's not that the person is demented or anything like that. It's just they're slower to answer the question. Information's there, just takes longer for them to process. Same thing with sensing changes in their body temperature. They're less likely to feel thirst. They're less likely to feel the change. Um, changes. This doesn't mean they can't feel it. It's just going to take them longer to feel it. And then there's the mobility issues can be a big issue. You like you have a bedridden patient um, due to age and illness and all that. Well, they may feel hot or the room may feel hot but they're not able to get out of bed to make a change or they're not able to move the blankets off of them. And so they're gonna have an increase of body temperature and not be able to change it. And then we talked about conditions like diabetes and heart issues and such like that. All right, 
And then you have these. We've thrown beta, uh, medications into the mix, diuretics that's dehydrating them, or beta blockers that prevents them from increasing their heart rate. If they're vasodilating, if they're trying to push blood to the peripheral and remove body heat, but yet they are on a beta blocker that's preventing their heart rate from increasing, they're not going to be able to move as much blood to the periphery. They're not going to. They're going to have a decrease in blood pressure. They're going to have an increased risk of syncope and things like that. So these are concerns we have to for in these patients we mentioned this earlier or i mentioned this earlier the increased body heat or excuse me the increased metabolic rate demanding more energy uh children are going to um run out of glucose and such uh quicker um it's harder for them to get rid of excess body heat because they already have a higher body heat um issue they're already producing <clears throat> more body heat <clears throat> and if you've ever uh taken care of little babies you've seen they have a really poor vasoconstrict vasodilation control this is where we get the modeling on their skin where it's like splotchy red and white all across their skin so some of the capillary beds are vasoconstricted others are vasodilated <laughs> And um, and then, of course, military recruits, athletes, firefighter trainees, a um, number of other circumstances, anybody who is experiencing high levels of exertion in a hot environment or wearing a lot of gear or something like that, they're going to be at an increased risk of heat illness. So here's our three levels of heat illness, heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. Cramps and exhaustion, very common, but not not really a big concern um one thing to keep in mind don't there there is a general misrepresentation of heat related emergencies in every emt textbook i have read and it converts to a lot of emts having the idea that the indication that oh we're um <clears throat> The difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke is the patient no longer sweats. That is not actually the case. In classic heat stroke, the patient may no longer be sweating, but in an exertional heat stroke, they are very likely sweating. So, a you know, an athlete, a firefighter uh, recruit, a uh, military um, trainee, or something like that, they're very, very likely still going to be sweating. You know, a patient is you know, working, you know, as a mechanic or a laborer or something like that in a vehicle in the hot dead of summer, they go into heat stroke, they are going to be sweating. So, um, <clears throat> don't look for, don't hesitate to treat them for the heat stroke just because they're still sweating. The, the sweating will happen. They will continue to sweat. It's a, um, less common to see sweating in heat stroke during classic heat stroke and we'll see it uh, i'll explain that more later but here we can see the difference what's going on um heat cramps we have a loss of sodium water heat exhaustion yes the sodium water has been lost but it is now to a point of hypovolemia and then heat stroke is kind of like going into shock where we are no longer able to compensate we've lost so much that our uh regulating uh, compensatory mechanisms have failed. Um, but this is a really good chart. I would recommend that you're very familiar with these um, stages here because this, this will be very useful when you're trying to treat your patients. So strongly encourage you to, be, um, to memorize this chart. Um, this is very useful info. All right, so heat cramps. They're gonna be sweating. They've lost a lot of salt because we sweat salt out right and they're going to result in muscle spasms these muscle spasms can be also confused with um repetitive motion spasms and cramping patient might um <clears throat> you know they may not be having heat cramps as much as they've just been doing the same exercise you know the swinging the same hammer or the same uh moving the same shovel and it's causing their hands to cramp or something like that it's not ne necessarily a heat cramp heat cramps tend to be muscle groups that weren't necessarily related to the exertion so you know um 
if you are hiking with a heavy backpack on and um, you know doing like a ruck march or something like that and you start having leg cramps well that's kind of expected but if you are you know if you're having cramps like abdominal cramps or something like that in a muscle group that wasn't related to the exertion or your activity then that's where we're going to start thinking this is probably more heat related of course anytime you have the exertion um, and the repetitive motion in the heat related emergency it's going to exasperate it so the person may start having exertional cramps or repetitive use cramps quicker because of the heat is that in my mid hopefully i'm making some sense there all right so what are our symptoms that we're going to see with these patients pain right the cramping muscles stretch them massage them but the big thing here is we need to get some fluids into them, get them cooled off. But nausea, rapid pulse, uh, pale moist skin, they're going to be overheated. They're going to feel overheated. And honestly, their temp probably won't change. It might be elevated a little bit, but likely it's going to be a normal temp because their body, while it's showing the effects of heat and getting and the removal of heat from them, they are, um, they're still able to maintain. They're still able to function. <clears throat> So get them out of the environment, get them some uh, fluids, uh, sports drinks, something to restore the lost salt and so uh, potassium and sodium. Um, if they're particularly nauseated, they may not need to be taking things orally, but if as long as they're conscious and not uh, vomiting, give them oral fluids. They don't need IV fluids, only go to IV if they're... Um, uh, struggling with severe nausea and you think they won't be able to keep their fluid um, it's down all right so you know salty chips pretzels uh some fruit something like that that's going to restore both the sugars and the salts those are really good ideas here to help um treat heat cramps this is not a condition that requires a uh, medical transport this can often be done in the field we're going to see these things when we do standbys at events uh whether they're sporting events or just large gatherings this is very common um, drink water, stretch it out kind of a thing. All right, heat syncope, very similar, uh, associated with heat cramps, not necessarily its own situation. It can present a little bit more of a concern. But as I said a minute ago, patients overheated, their body vasodilates, they're trying to dissipate heat, uh, increase heart rate, all that kind of stuff. And then if they stand up too quickly or move too quickly, they may pass out because of that relative hypovolemia. Um, and the or orthostatics that's created. Probably not a big issue. Probably not a major medical concern. Generally, they are not. They will wake up as soon as they hit the ground, as soon as their body is back to that horizontal state and they maintain blood flow to the brain again, they're going to uh, come to uh, very quickly. There will not be associated symptoms. <clears throat> chest pain and shortness of breath and such like that but it is very 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 important that you make sure you've ruled out all associated or all other potential causes of syncope because you know this person could be having a heart attack and we don't want to miss that so do the 12 lead um check their blood sugar uh check for uh toxins and things like that make certain you've um done a good evaluation your classic heat syncope patient is the um the stereotypical uh fourth of july um event party goer who goes to like the stone mountain or the the familiar um local parade fireworks where they're sitting in an open um, field in the sun in their lawn chair all day long drinking copious amounts of beer and um, listening to the music and all that and then all of a sudden they stand up really quick um, to go to the bathroom and they'll pass out because they've dehydrated themselves they've di vasodilated themselves they're overheated they stand up and they have the syncopal episode again make certain that you've ruled out associated or other not associated but other concerns that might cause syncope <clears throat> now moving from heat cramps to heat exhaustion this is a little bit more concerning than heat exhaust um, cramps but really not a big deal um in this case they are volume and salt depleted they are um they're not necessarily showing the muscle cramps as much as they're they're just 
dehydrated. This is like an extreme form of dehydration. Um, they will be tired. They will be weak. But their mental status is the, uh, normal. They're not altered. They're not confused. They're not uh, uh, unconscious or unresponsive. So headache, fatigue, weakness, dizziness, nausea and vomiting are going to become more of a concern. Cramping. You can see they're sweating. Uh, core temp still not elevated maybe but not significantly um so it's basically a uh this you know this is maybe your this is where we're going to see these people during uh fire rookie school or uh you know working a house structure fire in the middle of the summer or somebody who just finished a marathon or something like that um the uh, high school football game or football practice in the summer, you might see these kinds of concerns, heat exhaustion. So what are we going to do? Get them out of the heat, cool them off. This does not require any form of crazy rapid cooling. Oral hydration is the best. Um, get rid of anything that's causing them to be excessively um, hot. Sure, they can sit in front of a fan or, you know, wipe their brow with a cool rag or something like that kind of a thing, but we're just doing passive cooling. We're not doing active cooling. They don't need to be in an ice bath. They don't need anything like that. This is heat exhaustion. They just not that big of a concern. Uh, I don't think we'll be checking sodium levels in the field, so don't worry about that, but um, we will want to replace uh, fluids and sodium and potassium. So sports drinks, 50-50 uh, mix, or if they don't, you know, flavor-wise, drink a quart of this and then a quart of water kind of a thing. Uh, fluids are going to be used if the patient has uh, nausea or ha um, severe nausea or something like that. I'm not going to really, I would not recommend getting into worrying about hypertonic saline. We don't carry that traditionally but if we're suspecting the patient has really low sodium levels um they may need to go to the they may need to be transported to the er for um fluid resuscitation like um and sodium repla replacement um not really likely it's just very again heat exhaustion is not something that should require ems transport um very easily treated now if we're starting ivs and such like that then yes we should but um, if it's to that point. All right, heat stroke, highest level of heat-related emergency here. Um, it is not very common. This is one that we wanna get very aggressive with. Um, <clears throat> this is where the body is no longer able to maintain thermoregulation. The uh, functions of thermolysis are no longer working. The patient's body temperature is going up. We will see elevated core temps. Um, some recommendations say it has to be upwards of 100 uh, in five. Uh, I don't think I that's not here. I'm trying to remember where it was. I read that uh, earlier we saw that heat related issues are going to have a temperature of above 100.4. Honestly, if they're showing an elevated temp, we're going to go with heat stroke. Elevated core temp, altered mental status. Those are the two things that you look for to indicate heat stroke um hence the stroke altered mental status if, um your heat related emergency is lethargic altered confused um not with it heat stroke treat it very aggressively um heat stroke can cause the temp well, the body temperature can become elevated enough to cause nerve damage uh specifically in the brain and so that's why we're going to be very aggressive with this treatment uh here you can see the two different types classic versus exertional classic we tend to see in the very elderly and the very young this would be uh you know a stereotypically patient lives in a northern city why northern because northern cities are not built um uh, haven't built their buildings with good ventilation and air conditioning and cooling, especially older cities. You know, here in the South, we tend to think, oh, uh, we want air conditioning, we want cooling, we want ventilation. Uh, our indoor temperatures don't tend to get as crazy. Um, whereas older buildings uh, in uh, do have issues with that. So you have an elderly person living in an older building in a... Uh, during a heat wave or whatever, they're not able to get out of their bed or, or they're not, if um, they have limited mobility, so it's harder for them to get up and move around. Um, 
they are possibly limited on their uh, electric bill or something and so they can't they're not running their air conditioner or their building doesn't have good air conditioner um, cooling methods so that's where you're going to get your classic heat stroke this is a, they're in a hot environment they've been in that hot environment and they can't leave it exertional heat stroke is exactly what it sounds um, healthy fit individuals but you know like we've said athletes fire recruits um, stuff like that all right so signs and symptoms again you can see the combativeness the irritability the hallucinations these are altered mental status uh dehydration very much so pale and sweaty uh is exertional this is what we're going to see more of we're not really classic heat stroke is not very common um but that's one way to tell the difference between the two but remember elevated body temperature now it is necessary especially if you're suspecting a uh, classic heat stroke that you rule out the possibility of an infection make sure we're not dealing with sepsis here pneumonia uti something along those lines the patient simply because the treatment while they're both concerned the treatment is going to be a little different and you you know um some of these other concerns anticholinergic poisonings malignant hyperthermia they're less likely they tend to be obviously associated with uh, medical medications um but very very rare so you look at well have they been starting on a new medication some of the antipsychotics uh can cause it some of the anti-diabetic medications can lead to malignant hyperther hyperthermia and such like that <clears throat> all right get the patient in a cool environment cool as rapidly as possible if we're dealing with exertional heat stroke um while the general recommendations from like aha and such are still eh, on ice baths um the the standard recommendations in uh the athletic industry in the military and such like that is ice baths so uh you've got a patient with exertional heat stroke altered mental status um elevated core body temp bury them in ice this isn't just putting ice packs in their groin and their uh axillary areas we're talking bury them in an ice bath this, you know if an ice bath isn't available get them naked and pour ice on top of them um it is important imperative that the fluids be re, uh, replaced and that their body temperature be brought down rapidly and we're not going to leave them in the ice long enough that they're going to start getting frostbite obviously we're going to keep a very close eye on them once their body temperature is getting back down to normal we can get the ice off of them all right we're not, you know but we need to get that body temp down quickly when a, with a heat stroke patient this heat stroke can lead to cardiac arrest quite easily um so how do we prevent illnesses at the heat i think living in the south we're pretty familiar with that um acclimatize uh, don't show up in a new environment and start exerting yourself without exercising regularly in that environment and getting uh, building up your tolerance to the heat uh physical fitness very helpful with this fluids um regular hydration incur this is how we as firefighters or as ems workers or whatever else we do in our life can um prevent or avoid heat illness eat regularly uh stay hydrated that kind of a thing all stuff we can easily do while running uh 20 calls a shift in an ambulance all right so questions on heat related illnesses heat related emergencies i know we talked about a lot of different stuff there what um experiences do you guys have and um questions you have related to heat uh conditions I don't I don't think you're gonna find them on TikTok. Mm hmm I 
I believe that that is the uh, concern with where you have, uh, whether it's, um, yeah, it's, that's what it is. It's the relative humidity and the temperature. So when your um, air temp and the relative humidity both are to a certain point, that puts your heat index higher because that humidity, um, like the higher the humidity, the less likely it is you're going to be able to um, uh, comp, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Handle or, yeah, compensate for the uh, heat. Um, pulling up a chart here so I can show you. Here, um, All right, should be able to see this chart. Um, can you guys see that? It's from uh, NOAA. And it shows here that at, um, it, uh, excuse me, with a relative humidity of 40%, the heat index isn't at a dangerous level on um oops it's not at a danger level until the air temperature is 105 degrees and it's not at extreme danger until the air temperatures uh i said 105 in uh, 98 degrees or 108 degrees but at 80 100 uh, percent humidity danger is going to be at 88, uh, 86 degrees, and um, extreme danger is at 90 degrees. So that's what that's this number here that you can see where it's saying, well, with this temp and this humidity, our heat index would be 80 or 85 or whatever. And that's kind of like a um, converted temperature uh, based on that uh, humidity. So that that's how that plays. Your temp yes yes correct so you know people out in colorado or you know arizona they talk about oh it's 105 degrees out here yeah but it's like five percent humidity so your heat index isn't that far off from what the actual temperature is. Whereas here in Georgia, if we're dealing with 95% humidity, well, a temperature of 90 degrees could feel like a heat index of 127 degrees just because it's such a high humidity level. Obviously, I, you know, shouldn't... Don't take it uh, lightly. A um, dry heat has its own uh, concerns. There, there are a lot of associated uh, issues with dry heat um, as well. Dehydration is a much, much greater concern. Um, all right, so any other questions? Any other experiences with this heat-related emergencies? Um, do you guys, do any of y'all carry anything specific or unique during the summer in order to prepare for heat-related emergencies? Do you guys carry sports drinks? Um, how often are you uh, like performing rehab or setting up rehab for um, events or fires or um, hazmat scenes or something like that. Do you guys have equipment, uh, uh, water coolers and such like that in order to uh, respond to uh, events like that or um, house fires or whatever, structure fires where you have to uh, do rehab, provide rehab? National saying no. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So moving to cold related injuries. So 
<clears throat> with is that a question with cold related injuries you have two major categories you're going to have your local and then your generalized issues local injuries are going to be your frostbite as we can see here this is when a portion of the skin has gotten so cold that it is frozen um, the or gotten so cold that the blood flow to it is no longer happening and if it stays cold long enough it could result in necrosis or damage to the tissue due to a lack of blood flow it doesn't and as we'll see here um, cold related injuries don't require freezing but frostbite specifically does um, here are several different examples you can see it blistering up you can see it on toes and you see it on the tip of the nose as you can imagine frostbite is going to happen on parts of our body that are most exposed and have poorest circulation hence feet uh, toes nose uh, ears that kind of a thing all right What puts us at risk of frostbite? Well, you know, here you go. You touch something cold, you'll probably, you're at greater risk. But when we have lack of clothing or um, poor circulation due to diabetes or um, heart problems, or we're exhausted, fatigued, dehydrated, hungry, and we're not, fun uh, and we're still out in that cold environment, we're not gonna move ourselves away. We're not uh, from the cold. We're not going to be able to produce heat because we're, lacking glucose in order to produce the energy, uh, the ATP. So these are all things that are going to increase our risk here. <clears throat> so superficial, as you can see, um, the skin, the outer layers of the skin have lost sensation. Uh, they get a numb feeling, not the pins and needles. That comes with during the rewarming process, tends to be firm. It is very, very important that you do not squeeze, constrict, bump, bang, or any form of physical contact with frostbite injuries. Because if the frostbite is uh, prolonged enough to actually start freezing the water molecules in the cell, in the cytoplasm, we know water expands when it freezes. So these cells are be getting stretched and the water molecules are crystallizing, forming water crystals inside the cells. If you start rubbing, squeezing, or touching these cells, you can cause the cell to burst. Whereas the cell may not have burst simply because it froze, it may have stretched enough. But if you start aggravating it, you can break those cells, causing an increase of tissue damage. So it's really important to leave frostbite injuries alone. Don't touch them. Um, and we'll talk about <clears throat> thawing them here in a minute. When the frostbite injuries are thawing though when um they're you're rewarming them they are insanely painful because uh, you're getting extreme pins and needles sensations um as the blood is starting to return to the area as the nerves are waking up they it is extremely painful and should be uh you should be prepared to treat that appropriately here's a much deeper frostbite where you can see the um uh, necrosis of the skin, skin starting to turn black. This could, could easily lead to gangrene. It's not guaranteed, but it could lead to gangrene. Hyperbaric treatments can be useful for repairing this, but this is not emergency hyperbaric. You go to a regular ER and then they transfer, recommend the patient to wound care for hyperbaric treatments later. <clears throat> Again, you can see the injuries are going to be um, predominantly in the extremities, the most extreme extremities. So how do we handle it? Well, don't worry about how deep the wound is. It's pretty much we're going to send them this, um, treat them the same way. Two things to re um, remember about rewarming. Never rewarm if there's a risk of refreezing. This means if you are, you know, in that wilderness environment you're lost in the woods you're camping you're uh maybe maybe there's this ice storm and you're in a major pile up on the interstate and you don't know if you'll be able to transport from the scene if the patient's already dealing with frostbite don't try to rewarm the frozen tissue is frozen it's kind of in a state in a um static state there it's not going to get worse just don't um aggravate it don't bump it, squeeze it, or anything like that, and don't try to rewarm it if it could freeze again. 
Rewarming is very painful. Generally, once frostbite has set in, it's not a, they lose sensation in that um, extremity, so not a big, uh, not very painful. <clears throat> Rewarming can be difficult simply because of the pain and the having an adequate supply of uh, warm materials uh, or warming materials, whether that's warm water or tepid water or something like that. So get them out of the cold, get them out of the wet uh, clothing. Uh, I already mentioned the stuff about rubbing, massaging the wounds or the areas. Um, Rewarming can be done in a, like a basin of tepid, uh, lukewarm water. You don't want to do hot water because that could cause injury um, as well, you know, thermal injury. But um, anything that is warmer than their current um, temperature, ideally you want body temp uh, water. And then you put them in a basin and they kind of like drape their fingers, dangle their fingers in or whatever uh, extremity is in uh, for frostbit dangle it down into the water so that it's not touching the sides of the um, container or anything like that. This is where you're going to need to use a lot of medication, pain medications. They will be very uncomfortable. Um, so there you go, body temp, 98 to 100 degrees um, pain meds. All right, what is trench foot or chillablanes? Trench foot is very much like frostbite. It looks a lot like frostbite. It feels a lot like frostbite. However, the body is not frozen. This is not, um, the temperatures are only down, uh, you know, could be as much as 60 degrees. It's not f sub 32 degrees. Uh, this comes from the extremity or the tissue being exposed to lower than body temperature, temperatures and being wet you know we saw it uh military saw it a lot uh during trench warfare where the uh, uh soldiers were in uh the mud in the water their boots were always wet their socks were always wet um so their feet were cold and damp cold and wet all the time that is what leads to the trench foot it's the same kind of thing it's a, the body shunts blood away because it doesn't want to lose the body temperature there and that results in a decreased oxygenation and leads to necrosis of the tissue so that's what uh trench foot is this is um you ever watch an old world war ii movie doc i'm just this well change your socks you know What's that going to do? Well, it's going to keep their feet dry. It's going to keep them from getting cold. It's going to prevent uh, trench foot, and which can lead to gangrene and such like that. All right, chillablans. This, again, not requiring freezing, but very cold. So, you know, upper 30s, low 40s environment. Uh, this is where the patient has been in that environment for a really long time, and it's just starting to cause, like... Uh, you might call it, think of it like a wind burn or something, um, you know, in cold weather on their face. Not something that's going to require EMS care. Trench foot probably won't require EMS care. Um, so frostbite will. They're they're going to need to go to the hospital get that re um, warmed. Uh, they're going to need pain medication and such like that to uh, control that. All right, moving from. <coughs> Excuse me. Moving from local em cold emergencies to generalized cold emergencies, such as hypothermia. Notice we're not thinking hypothermia until core temp gets down to 95 degrees. Are we going to shiver? Are we going to have uh, symptoms prior to 95 degree core temp? Yes. But as far as it be considering hypothermia, it's not until it gets below 95 degrees. All right, so unlike heat emergencies where you have cramps, exhaustion, and then stroke, hypothermia, it's pretty much you're cold and then you have hypothermia. Um, there's not like multiple stages here. There are mild, moderate, and severe hypothermia that are based on core body temperatures. Most of the time though for us in the EMS, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we're gonna treat it pretty much the same. So these are the patients. Why are they cold stress? Why are they hypothermic? There you go. Kind of already hit on all those points before. All right. Risk factors again. All right. <clears throat> Cold temp, wet, dehydrated, lots, been out in the weather too long, didn't wear the right clothing, whatever it happens to be. Lots of different things. Ooh, alcohol, right? What does alcohol do? 
it numbs their senses. They don't feel cold. So they're like, oh, it's not that cold. I don't need an extra jacket or whatever. And so they expose themselves to colder temperatures longer because they are not noticing the sensation. Um, Mythbusters, you can find it on YouTube. Great episode on does alcohol warm you up? How does alcohol impact the cold environment? You know, the old, oh, I got to drink some whiskey to stay warm in the winter or whatever. Well, you feel warm, but you're not. And actually, uh, they were able, they showed that alcohol does not keep you warm. And in fact, it increases your risk of hypothermia um, uh, significantly. But that was a fun uh, episode to watch Adam and um, Jamie uh, get uh, sloshed on the show. All right. So you talked about a um, homeless man had a hypothermia the other day. How many, who else is dealing with hypothermic patients these days? They can happen rural or uh, urban, um, the, all types of environments. Um, the uh, the big concern is where you have patients who slip and fall um, outside at night and aren't found until the morning. Uh, another example of inebriation, uh, you know, person comes home drunk or whatever and then falls asleep on the driveway. I've run that call before. All right, we talked in the trauma unit about how trauma patients, when they're going into shock and such like that, have a decreased ability to produce and maintain body temperature under normal conditions. So a trauma patient is going to have a higher risk of hypothermia during um, cold weather because they're even... Um, less able to maintain body temp. And so what may have been a rather easily handled trauma can be complicated quickly by hypothermia if, you know, you know, in that cold weather environment. And this kind of we pointed out during trauma, you know, doing scene size up. You know, a patient falls off their motorcycle on the side of the highway at two o'clock in the afternoon um, in July, not nearly the concern that you have the same patient, same motorcycle, same highway at two o'clock in the morning in January. Very different condition there. All right, so what do we do? Conserve their body heat. They're um, getting them out of their wet clothes, getting them off of anything wet is very important, but then covering them up with some blankets. Uh, another thing that works really well are the space blankets, the uh, foil plastic, uh, foil coated blankets. Those are very effective for warming a patient up. Now, if it's really windy, not they're still gonna feel cold through it. It's only going to trap in the body heat that they're already making. So, you know, you put hot packs up under it, it's gonna help trap that in. But I like to use the um, regular blankets and then put the space blanket on top of it. Um, there's been other times where I had to reverse that, you know, put the space blanket directly against their skin and then put other blankets on top of it to help uh, keep the outside, to um, insulate them from the outside. Uh, conditions. Once you get into the ambulance, generally just wrapping them in the space blanket is going to be uh, sufficient. It's a, a very effective way to uh, warm them up because it doesn't allow body heat to escape and moisture to escape through it. Symptoms of hypothermia. Early symptoms, stumbles, umbles, or excuse me, stumbles, fumbles, mumbles, and grumbles. If it ends in an umble, it's a symptom. This is results with a decreased uh, coordination. They're, so they're stumbling, they're fumbling, they can't use their fingers. The altered, the decreased um, mental status means they're not able to um, speak clearly. So they're mumbling a lot more. They're grumbling, they're very irritable, they're very um, <clears throat> cantankerous, difficult. These are all early signs of hypothermia. Oh, of course, along with shivering. But shivering, we don't, you know, that doesn't mean they're hypothermic at all. So here you see mild hypothermia, 
core body temps between 93 and what does it have to be? What's the body temp have to be to be hypothermia? 95. So 93 to 95 is mild. Moderate is 86 to 93. Severe is anything below 86. It doesn't really matter that you know those numbers. Honestly, that's not going to be a big concern. And um, this is not going to significantly change how you treat those patients. <clears throat> Uh, acute, subacute, chronic, don't get too hung up on that. We're pro predominantly, we're going to be seeing the acute hypothermia and uh, treating it as such. Um, patients cold, we warm them up, that kind of a thing. Primary, because they're in the cold. Secondary, as you can see, septic, a patient is septic. And so um, due to the septic shock, they're not producing body heat anymore. And that's kind of where you have your afebrile sepsis. Um, a lot less common i mean it exists but we don't treat it the same way you can also see this on a patient with a cardiogenic shock um i had a patient one time who uh extremely low blood pressure altered mental status uh well unresponsive uh heart rate of 30 <clears throat> had to pace them uh you, you know pacer fluids vasodil uh, constrictors the whole nine yards got him to the hospital blood pressure started coming up with my treatments and all that kind of stuff i had a rather short transport but when they um the patient was later admitted to the icu with a core body temp of 85 degrees why because they were in cardiogenic shock they weren't pro uh, providing blood flow to the extremities and producing body heat the way they should and the er wasn't monitoring their blood their body temp the er left the patient in basically their underwear on the bed, you know, pacer running, that kind of thing in the normal temperature room. They didn't cover the patient up. They didn't re keep the patient warm. And so the patient passively cooled in the room just due to the air temperature and a, a decreased um, ability to maintain their body heat. So this is important when we're taking care of these patients and we monitor that body temp or at least be aware of it. You know, cover the patient up. Don't expose them unnecessarily and things like that. So um, yeah, in that particular scenario it had nothing to do with the care that we provided. It was completely on the uh, fault of the ER. <clears throat> All right. Like I said, doesn't really matter what the core temp is, looking for the signs and symptoms here because there's not a good correlation. So, um, mentioned that those things already. Always, always, always rule out the possibility of head injury, stroke, psychosis, uh, alcohol intoxication. But the problem is a lot of these things can happen at the same time. Patient could have slipped and fell, hit their head, head injury, and then became hypothermic or had a stroke, which caused them to fall or have decreased mobility, the resulting in hypothermia. So there can be a uh, combination of problems here. In that case, what is the greater concern? Probably your head injury or your stroke is going to be a much greater concern than the hypothermia. Um, so. Uh, don't transport to the inappropriate facility, wrong facility, simply because you didn't identify that stroke. I've mentioned this several times, so I'm not going to get into it anymore. All right, so if, what do we do for the hypothermic patient who is in cardiac arrest? Well, the old adage, they're not dead until they're warm and dead. This does not include the patient who is cold and stiff in a warm environment. We're thinking here about patients who are cold and stiff in a cold environment. Was it the cold that caused the arrest or was um, you know, something else? We want to warm those patients up. You know, you come into a home that's got normal heat running and all that kind of stuff and it's, you know, 75 degrees in the house and the patient's cold and stiff in the bed. Well, no, they're not hypothermic. They didn't freeze. They're dead and in rigor and they've been dead for a while. That's, you know, we're not working that. We're talking about the person found in the cold environment. V-fib, you're going to do um, rewarming while you're <clears throat> um, working. You do one defibrillation. You're going to do one med admin. You're not going to do rep repeated med admins um, until you get the patient warmed back up.
because those medications are not going to be perfusing. They're not going to be, and so they'll be more concentrated in the heart until their body is warmed up and blood is flowing throughout it again. So that's why we only need to do the one medication and the one defib. Hypothermia and cold weather environments can aggravate asthma. People with pre-existing pulmonary conditions can uh, have problems with the cold environment because of the irritation it creates in the lungs as they're breathing in and out on that cold, ha cold air. Um, you can see here where the shivering stops at 91 degrees. Doesn't really matter. Patient's cold and they're no longer shivering. That's a really good indication. They're very cold and they're hypothermic and you need to um, act pretty quickly. Here's an example of the cold call, talking you were saying with your uh, homeless patient. He, his muscles were all stiff. Cold muscles will become stiffer um, as the shivering stops. So prevent hate loss and try to rewarm them. Can we do uh, heat packs? Yes. Um, Warm IV fluids uh, are very useful. So mild hypothermia in 95 to 90 degrees, passive rewarming. We're just going to, um, you know, what I just listed there. Moderate hypothermia, this is active external rewarming. This is where you're putting hot packs up against some hot water bottles. Um, there are various, um, like huggers uh, at the hospital where they're blowing warm air across the patient where they're trying to more aggressively warm the body up and then severe this is where they do core rewarming what they do is they'll pump uh, they'll put uh, tubes uh, down into the stomach and stuff and they pump warm water in and out and they're rewarming them from the core so um, again that's going to be pre uh, in the hospital not in a pre-hospital environment Yeah, active, active external rewarming. Yep. It's uh, it's not so. It's not core rewarming. It's uh, it's going in through peripheral IVs, and uh, so it's a replay replenishment of fluid that's going to not cause them to get cold. Um, it's not really enough heat because it's quickly dissipated it's not really enough heat to be causing core rewarming yeah yeah they don't so the severe hypothermic those patients are unresponsive and that's why they're putting tubes down their throat and pumping hot water or warm water through them like that to try to warm them up from the inside Oh, uh, I bet he didn't. I bet he didn't. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, yeah, I already covered all this kind of stuff with hypothermia, cardiac arrest. Now, if the patient has parts of their extremities frozen solid like the joints are solid their airway is frozen you can't open their airway because of the frozen tissue they are dead like that has been they've been dead long enough that they're freezing this is not a condition where you're going to rewarm them uh, the whole warm and dead that's you've pulled the patient out of the um water out of the snow and they're um they're just cold. They're not frozen. Don't don't um don't overthink it there. All right. So that ends the hypothermia section. Uh, questions, uh, thought, any further concerns or thoughts on hypothermia? Um, see, Golden Triangle, you guys are being really quiet out there today. Um, what do you guys do for hypothermia? What do you guys carry this time of year to uh, prepare for hypothermia? Katie, wake up. Do you, 
Do you guys have a way of warming your IV fluids? Yeah, I did that for uh, years up in Kentucky and Pennsylvania. Uh, we never had warmers. Warmers would be really handy um, to keep the IV fluids warm. And of course, uh, hot packs and such like that. Do you guys stock a lot of space blankets? Gotcha. Ours are, um, they, they've gone to all baby sizes uh, because that's really what they are required to have them for is for the baby bunting. But, um, okay, cool. So about the same. Warmers are nice. Uh, IV warmers are nice. I've even seen some IV warmers where it um, the, you don't have to warm the bag or keep the bag warm. You hook it up to the IV line and it warms the fluid as it goes through it so that any bag of fluid can be used. Um, and then you just set it up when you need it and you plug it in. So that's a really uh, good option as well. So, um all right, let's uh, stretch our legs, wake up, and uh, get get the blood moving. Drowning. So it's funny. Highly preventable. I like how they always they start with that. If you don't go in the water, you probably won't drown. But there's always other issues. So <clears throat> let's uh, look a little bit at how the process of drowning works. You may have heard of things like wet drowning versus dry drowning. Um, <clears throat> we're actually, we don't get too worried about that in the pre-hospital environment. Um, so don't stress on that one. Care is going to be pretty much the same either way. Uh, <clears throat> the drowning continuum, this is what happens. Patient falls into the water, they're underwater, face goes underwater, they start holding their breath. It's a natural um, reaction. Once water, though, touches their larynx, their vocal cords will spasm, laryngeal spasm will take place, trying to um, instinctively prevent water from going into their lungs. This is why you'll hear terms like dry drowning. The patient drowned, but their lung water never went into their lungs because the laryngeal spasm uh, protected them. Once the patient starts to... Um, build up CO2 in their lungs because of not getting fresh oxygen and all that kind of stuff, you'll start to see a, um, that's when the altered mental status will happen. They'll start passing out. This will lead to cardiac arrest, uh, ultimate death. So the mental status changes will happen first. And then <clears throat> that's uh, one reason why you pull somebody out they may be unconscious and responsive, but then, but they're not dead yet because that hasn't been that long. So that's the basic continuum. Uh, variations can happen, cause the uh, laryngeal spasm to relax, the lungs will fill with fluid, uh, washing out the surfactant, um, things along those lines. And then uh, we'll see some other, I'll talk about some other option uh, situations here later on. So who is at risk? Well, kids, little toddlers, bathtubs, buckets, um, things like that. Uh, being left unattended, a infant or toddler uh, can drown in a very small amount of water if they're not able to lift their face out of the water, um, or if they've um, injured their head and you know aren't conscious or something like that. It doesn't take very much water in a bathtub to be a concern there. <clears throat> School age, preschool age kids are at risk of pools. Norm toddlers, there is some risk there, but they're t generally pretty easy to prevent them from getting close to a pool. Um, the school age kids uh, tend to be a little bit more ballsy and get out into the water where they don't need to be. And then because of goofing off and playing, they may everybody thinks they're just playing, but they're actually drowning uh, or having a you know problem. So that's where that risk comes from. Uh, older kids and young adults, it's not so much pools as much as it is the lakes, rivers, where they're out. Um, at risk of injury due to their diving into the water or some other um, environmental factor or alcohol involved or just simply being alone or um, remote area so that when in a relatively non-concerning emergency happens, it progresses pretty quickly because they can't get help to them. So that's where you're going to see the drowning. Um, <clears throat> 
I've only worked a couple of drownings in my career. They were actually all here, male, um, around the age of 20, um, or there, there about, um, and alcohol was involved. Um, I can't, I don't think I've ever worked one in like a bathtub or a pool uh, environment, um, swimming pool environment. Another concern is the shallow water blackout, and we will, I'll, I'll explain more about that here in a little bit. So, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me. All right, so generally the problem is going to start with the patient not being able to keep their uh, face out of the water. This is uh, could be due to their, their swimming their, and they start getting a cramp and now they can't tread water, but they're in, in over their head or they've injured themselves in some way or they're, um, they have a lack of coordination due to hypoglycemia or alcohol intoxication, something along those lines. Um, or the water uh, conditions are too rough. Um, so we already i mentioned uh the continuum a minute ago so as you can see um the this is the same thing yeah pretty much the same same thing not gonna nothing new here it is important that we get the patient out of the water before we attempt resuscitation trying to um trying to resuscitate the patient while they're still floating in the water is you're, you're wasting your energy. Um, you're working just like any other cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest, suction the airway, clear the airway, um, CPR, nothing different there. It is really not a good idea to go in and try to rescue a person who's drowning if you haven't been trained to do so. The, uh, let's see, I think it, where's the, hmm. It's in your textbook. Um, it's an act, the uh, idiom reach, um, reach, throw, row, go. That is the order that you um, try to rescue the patient. You'll reach out to them with a pole or something that you can extend out to them in the water so they can grab a hold of. You throw a rope or a float to them to pull them in. Um, then you take a boat or something to go out there uh, <clears throat> that's the row and then the last option is actually swimming out to them if you have not been trained in how to rescue a person who's drowning do not attempt to do so um, because the chances the likelihood is they will uh, drown you as well a person who is drowning who is still conscious is uh, extremely out of control uh, they do not respond rationally and they will push you underwater trying to climb on top of you to stay out from under uh, the water so do not attempt to make that kind of a rescue uh, unless you've been trained in the proper methods on how to uh, how to uh, rescue a drowning patient once the patient's unresponsive though um, there's less concern of them injuring you, but unless you know how to, you know, effectively flip them over and pull them um, and pull them while you're swimming, and you're not, you know, unless you're a strong swimmer, it would not be a good idea for you to go out there, um, especially if they're unresponsive. At that point, it's likely too late anyway. So uh, waiting a little bit longer to get a person who's not going to be injured by uh, attempting the rescue would be a smarter idea. <clears throat> Um, so think about C-spine whenever the patient has a risk of trauma. Why did they get drowned? Why did they go underwater? Um, did they dive into the water and hit their neck or hit their head on the bottom of the uh, water, you know, on the lake pool, whatever it is? Or, you know, was it a jet ski accident or a boating accident or something like that? You know, is there a risk of trauma? Um, cervical spine should be maintained if possible, but it is difficult to do so in the water it basically means you're grabbing a hold of their shoulders and trying to keep their neck in line you're not pulling them by the head but you're trying to support the head with your forearms um, very difficult to move a person that way um, so most of the time they're just floating and keep uh, trying to keep them in line as you um, drag them to the shore or to the edge um, yeah 
it, drowning uh, resuscitation is the same as a um, any other cardiac arrest. The one thing you want to consider though is the more the increased likelihood of fluid in their lungs, and um, so suctioning is going to be important. And if the patient starts breathing spontaneously. Um, there's a really good chance you're going to need CPAP to um, help maintain the pressures in their lungs because they're going to fill uh, with fluid. A big concern with drowning is ARDS, the uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, basically where their lungs become hardened uh, and dried out as the uh, water removes all the surfactant and um, the alveoli get crusty. And so that is a difficult condition to recover from. Uh, CPAP is really helpful for um, keeping the airways open, preventing atelectasis, but um, this isn't going to happen on scene. This is going to happen like the next day or later that day at the hospital after the fluid has been evacuated. So, uh, but it is something to be anticipating. Even a patient who swallowed a bunch of water or inhaled a lot of water, they've coughed it out, there is a good, there is a risk of ARDS there. That patient should be evaluated. They should have a chest x-ray um, and they may need antibiotics. So they're, um, because of, depending on if they inhaled any bacteria or something, protozoas or who else or whatever else they've inhaled. Um, inhaled. So a near drowning or a partial drowning should be transported. You should not get refusals on patients who were drowning or drowned. That is, um, you know, yeah, maybe they're acting fine now, um, but they should be evaluated for um, inhalation injuries and such like that. <clears throat> yeah, that is, you know, not much there. Uh, this this goes with I think I feel like this goes without saying. This is just how you take care of um, cardiac arrest patients. All right, talked about CPAP. You can do the same thing with PEEP while you're ventilating the patient with a BVM after you've uh, you know, or if you've in, well, especially after you've established an ET tube. Uh, drowning patients in cardiac arrest, ET tubes are very important. This is definitely one of those scenarios where I would. Um, prioritize the advanced airway. Uh, PEEP, that positive end expiratory pressure, will help improve um, gas exchange and lung function. Uh, nasogastric tubes, oral gastric tubes, but decompress that. So uh, put a, a, a gastric tube down there and suck that stomach out. If they've swallowed water, there's vomit in there, you want to get that out. If there's gas down in there, all of that Removing their stomach contents will improve ventilation and circulation. <coughs> now, there have been a number of um, patients effectively resuscitated and returned to a functional life after as much as an hour in cold water of uh, submersion in cold water. Don't give up on these submersion patients, old or young. The younger they are, the better the chance is. This doesn't mean, you know, they've been in there, um, you know, unknown period of time. Well, sometimes dead is dead, and sometimes we have to just say that. But if there is hope of resuscitation, if there's, you know, we know how long they, we know when they fell in the water, uh, we have workable rhythms or something like that, then go ahead and work it. Don't, uh, this is not one of those where I'm going to work 20 minutes and call it. We're probably going to transport and do everything possible to get these patients back because there's a, they have a higher chance of recovery from long or from extended uh, submersion than they do, say, just somebody who drops out with a cardiac arrest. Remember, this wasn't cardiac arrest because of heart conditions or a uh, major disease process. This was a sudden cardiac arrest as a result of hypoxia. So if we can fix that hypoxia, we have a really good chance of getting the heart back because there's theoretically nothing wrong with the heart in the first place. All right. Um, <coughs> of course, any of these things could be associated. You want to make sure you've treated those appropriately as well. All right. Um, 
Here's where some of your other issues are going to come in. We've talked about, um, I mentioned ARDS, adult respiratory. It's not supposed to say adult. It's supposed to say acute because it can happen in any patient. <clears throat> acute respiratory distress syndrome. So we know that our lung lining is filled with surfactant and that surfactant reduces the surface tension allows gas exchange to be more effective keeps the alveoli from uh sticking to each other and allows them to open up and um such like that it's produced by the goblet cells on the uh epithelial linings of the um lungs now what happens when we put water well what do you remember what is surfactant do you, do you remember what it's made up of? Back to A&P, what, what do we know about surfactant? I just described its function, where it comes from, but what is it? It is. It is a mucousy substance, and it's made of phosphorus and lipids. It's a phospholipid fluid, and <clears throat> phosphorus is an ion, uh, an electrolyte that can disassociate in water. So you put water in it. The phosphorus is going to, uh, you know, dissolve in the water. But the lipid. What is lipid? What do lipids do in water? Oil and water. Yeah, yeah, they don't mix, and lipids always float on the water. So <clears throat> you fill the lungs with water, and that phospholipid surfactant is going to float out. It's going to be one of the first things suctioned out, and so it's all going to be removed. You get the water removed, and now you have dry lung linings. There's no mucus there. It's going to take a while for the um, cells to reproduce or to produce enough surfactant again to coat the inside of the lungs. So think about it this way. You ever, you probably had a leather um, object, you know, leather gloves, leather belt, something like that at some point. What happened when that leather item got wet and then, you know, like saturated and then dried out? Lost Savannah, I just noticed. The Savannah group. So tell me, what happens? Yeah, it, grow, it gets hard, it gets crunchy, it cracks and it rips. That is what adult or acute respiratory distress syndrome is. It is the alveolar line, the alveoli of the lungs drying out, getting crispy, getting crunchy, and then they will split. So it'll result in pulmonary, um, excuse me, pneumothorax and things like that. So this is why um, it's important, or this is why our is such a concern. Patients with ARDS are going to use PEEP and they're going to, they may need CPAP, but that uh, severe ARDS cases are actually going to be put on ventilators that are called oscillators, where they move a very small amount of air very rapidly in and out of the lungs. And so the actual size and the expansion, uh, the lungs are never expanding. They just have air flowing in and out of them and not having that move expansion and contraction so that you're not stressing and stretching the alveoli, allowing them to uh, rep um, produce surfactant and uh, without splitting and cracking. Another th thing you might hear of with these ARDS patients is ECMO. This is extracorporeal oxygen, uh, membrane uh, oxygenation. So it's kind of like, uh, well, it's a heart-lung machine. It, you know, it's what a dialysis machine uh, does for the kidneys, except it's doing it for the lungs. And it pumps the blood out of the body, oxygenates the blood, and pushes it back into the body so the patient doesn't need to use their lungs um, 
and they can continue to oxygenate and circulate that way while the lungs um, are uh, healed. So hypoxic brain injury, obviously, you know, anytime you have hypoxia, you're looking at the brain injury. Of course, mods, because of the uh, hypoxic injury, the essentially creating the shock. Uh, we've talked about mods before under various other forms of shock. And then <clears throat> sepsis, because of infection, uh, whether it was inhaled bacteria or protozoa or algae, fungi, something like that, they've gotten crap in their lungs and now it's spreading to sepsis. So those are some of our concerns that we're going to look for after drowning. And for these reasons, you can see hours to days, not immediately after. For these reasons, every drowning patient should be transported for evaluation, chest x-rays, cultures, and things like that to make certain that you're not they're not at risk of these problems. Because they can happen hours afterwards, a patient could dr uh, have a drowning incident, cough it all up, oh, I'm okay, okay, uh, I'll be all right go to bed and not wake up because of the ARDS or a fluid shift that happened in the middle of the night or something like that. Um, so anyway, don't get refusals on drowning patients. Did I, can I say that enough? All right, so submerged vehicle incidences. Um, if you are in a submerged vehicle, um, Take your seatbelt off, then break the window, then uh, remove the children, and then get out. Uh, there's <clears throat> this is if you're in the vehicle. Obviously, being outside the vehicle is a totally different thing. You are not trained to do submerged vehicle rescue. Do not attempt to do so unless you want to drown with the victims. So, um. It says that the safest time to escape a sinking vehicle is as soon as it's entered the water. Maybe, yeah, you're on the surface of the water. But here's the thing. If your windows are closed, it's actually really hard to open the vehicle door underwater until it has full, filled with water. Um, and if you have electric windows, it's a good chance that the... Um, you, you, the window will short out and you won't be able to open it. Um, so breaking the window is the best plan um, in order to relieve that pressure so that you can open the door. But a air inside the vehicle, do, vehicle door underwater, completely submerged, it's really hard to open that door. So um, yeah, that's, that, that's a pretty ugly one. It's like some, rescuing somebody from a submerged vehicle is a very dangerous process getting yourself out of a submerged vehicle very dangerous um uh zero out of ten would not recommend so all right um so that's those are specific drowning concerns with um <clears throat> yeah now we're going to move into diving injuries talking about um scuba diving or various forms of diving not diving into the water that's more of a trauma concern and kind of goes into the drowning category we just talked about um, we're talking about various forms of diving so you see scuba breath hold surface tended and saturation now all the difference is scuba self-contained underwater breathing apparatus tank on their back got a regulator in their mouth can go down until their tank is um, empty or you know based on their diving calculations I'm really going to try not to nerd on this one. Um, I am scuba certified. I really do enjoy it. So I'll try really hard not to nerd out on you guys. Uh, breath hold diving is basically um, what it sounds like. A uh, person holds their breath, uh, dives to the bottom. They may like ride a rock or an anchor, you know, a weight down uh, to the bottom. Uh, swim around on the bottom for a little bit, swim back up, pull the anchor up, and have them drop them down again. Uh, surface tended is kind of like the old, um, is that classic uh, copper dome uh, hard hat diving that you might think of. It's still done in various forms. It's where they have a continuous supply of air from the surface. Um, they are attached to a tether and they are limited on their depth and things like that. Saturation diving is really wild stuff these people are breathing um really unusual mixtures of gas um it's not air um it's high um it may be 100 percent oxygen or it might be a variation of like a lower than normal oxygen and it's designed for them to go really deep 100 percent oxygen very shallow um 
lower mixtures, lower concentrations of oxygen would be for very deep dives. And I'll explain a little about that later. Um, the big issue, um, we'll see several different issues here with diving emergencies, but uh, let's first talk about some of the physics with this. All right, so we understand water has weight air has weight but waters the weight of water is much greater than that of air and so the deeper that you go underwater the more water there is above you and that column of water above you is constantly pushing down the column of air above you is pushing down on you right now creating a pressure if we were to measure that pressure it would be approximately 14.7 psi the entire atmosphere column of air above your head pushes down to a surface level of you know um, sea level pressure of 14.7 pounds per square inch 760 millimeters or we call that one atmosphere that is standard air pressure at sea level um so you know what is this uh our atmosphere something like a hundred thousand feet or something uh you know, crazy high like that, that's a lot of air. Well, one atmosphere underwater is only 33 feet. So 33 feet of water, and this in this case, salt water, is it saying, equals the entire atmosphere's worth of pressure. So every 33 feet you go down, you're increasing another atmosphere worth of pressure. So sea level is one. And then 33 feet down, you're all you're at two. So that's 28, uh, no, 29.4 psi. And then at 66, you're adding another 14.7. And I'm not doing math very fast. So it's like 44 psi or something like that. And so as you can see, you keep creating higher pressures. This is, but of course it's you know incremental, and that's why you might feel your ears pop or you feel pain in your ears if you swim to the bottom of an eight foot swimming pool. Um, because even though you haven't gone in a full atmosphere, you've increased that pressure by, you know, let's say it's a 10 foot swimming pool, like an Olympic swimming pool or whatever. You've increased that pressure by a third of an atmosphere, which would be equivalent to about five PSI. So you think you can see how that uh, pressure is going to increase pretty quick. This is one of the issues that we have to consider when our patients are underwater for that period of time is, um, it's because of that increased pressure, their oxygen and the way they breathe and the way their body uses and absorbs the gases is going to be very different. So right now, you take a breath of air. That air is moving into your lungs and being forced against your alveoli at a pressure of 14.7 PSI approximately. You know, obviously altitude varies it a little bit in weather and all that. When you go down one atmosphere at 33 feet, you've now doubled that. Now that air is being forced against your lungs at 28, almost 29.4 29 PSI. So as you can see, that's more pressure. And what that's going to do is affect um, Henry's gas law. Now, I, um, Henry's gas law here explains or states that the amount of gas absorbed into a liquid or dissolved into a liquid is proportionate to the pressure of that gas, right? So this is why when you take a carbonated beverage, and you open the lid, right? You hear the escape, you hear the psh, and you hear the gas really, and you look inside and you see all the bubbles rising to the surface. That's CO2. The airspace at the top of the liquid in that container was full of CO2. Under pressure, you've released that pressure, and now the CO2 is dissolving out of, or not dissolving out, but boiling out of the water or out of the liquid. Same thing is going on in our lungs. That's how we get oxygen into our lungs or into our blood. That's how we get CO2 out of our blood. It's because of pressures. Well, when we go down underwater and we're breathing through, whether it's surface tended or breath hold or whatever it is, the air in our lung is under pressure. So therefore more oxygen is being forced into our lungs. The same principle exists when we put a patient on CPAP or PEEP, or if we're trying to put a patient on 100% oxygen at sea level, we're increasing the pressure of oxygen against the alveoli and increasing the amount of oxygen dissolved into their lungs. So if we go underwater 
and we're breathing oxygen and we're at 33 feet down, we're now twice the amount of oxygen being absorbed. And it's actually, I should say, it doesn't really matter for this class, but it's not an exact, it's not linear. It's, um, there's a formula for it. And it changes a lot. It's, you know, what's the pressure and how much the you know, a gas is going to be absorbed because it and it varies per gas. Don't worry about that, but you can think of it linearly. You know, you go down, you know, you double your pressure, you're going to double your absorption. You know, think of it that way from an example. That doesn't really matter. All right. So that's <clears throat> more oxygen getting absorbed, more nitrogen getting absorbed. It's going to be harder for us to exhale the CO2 or, or, um, depending on the gases that we're breathing or the method that we're using. So another big concern to keep in mind is this. When under pressure, liquid doesn't change its volume. You know, a cup of liquid at the surface of the ocean and a cup of liquid at the bottom of the ocean are the same amount of water. The water does not compress. The molecules do not get closer together. It is already compressed. However, gas, because the molecules are so active, can compress. You can take a balloon and squeeze it tighter, increasing its pressure. And this is what happens with air underwater. As you can see, a one inch diameter bubble at surface will shrink, as you can see in this chart, as it goes down, you know, loses 20% of its volume at 33 feet and another 20 percent, you know, uh, what is that another 10 percent going down and it's proportionately less each time, but it continues to shrink as it's compressed, as the gases, as you know, the pressure is increased on it. But the concern here is when the patient's coming back up. If a person's been down scuba diving and they hold their breath, as they come up, the air in their lungs was small and compressed. It will expand out and it could cause them to pop their lung, creating a pneumo. It could pop their eardrums um, or other um, air pockets. An example of this would be, does anybody know uh, yourself or maybe a family member that complains of pain in a bone that they, they, you know, they broke a bone and they get pain in it every time a storm comes? You know, um, you know, they say, oh, grandma can predict uh, the weather by her trick knee or something like that. You, you know what I'm talking about? People who are like, oh, I, my, you know, this old fracture in my wrist hurts now. Um, that means there's a storm coming. And that's because the air pre there was air trapped in that bone, in that fracture from the original injury. And now every time the air pressure changes, it takes longer for that air trapped inside that bone to equalize. And so there is a, um, a pressure difference there. Kind of like when you're flying in an airplane and your ears pop or you swim to the bottom of a swimming pool and you can feel the pressure in your ears. That's that difference of pressure because of the compression of gases underwater. And so we'll talk a little later about how um, uh, how that affects some of the concerns that we're going to face with our patients. Now, <clears throat> All right, Dalton's law, this is about gas mixtures. You know, if, you know, you have a mixture of multiple gases and one of the gases is 50% of the mixture, it's going to be equivalent to 50% of the pressure. That's not really going to spend a lot of time on Dalton's. We talked a lot more about that back in respiratory and we talked about why we're giving, you know, 21% oxygen room air versus 100% oxygen to non-rebreather and how that changes things. So not going to worry about that too much. I already talked about Henry's law. We know the standard mixture of gas in the atmosphere, 78, 78, 79% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, other gases, not, not to get too worried about that. All right. Um, <clears throat> so with all of that, the patient scuba dive, the person's down underwater, they're under higher pressure, more gas is being forced into their blood from um, due to the higher pressures than normal, meaning there's a higher level of nitrogen in their blood, there's a higher level of oxygen in their blood. And when they come to the surface, 
if they come to the surface too quickly, all of that gas will want to instantly boil out of their blood and it'll form air pockets, just like when you open a carbonated beverage. So they need to come to the surface slowly and exhale a certain amount of time at, at various depths so that they can get rid of that gas more gradually in order to prevent that bubbling out, that boiling out of um, <clears throat> their uh, gases like nitrogen specifically nitrogen is the really big one and we can call that we would call that uh, decompression schedule but it would also lead to a, what's called decompression sickness or the bends and I'll see, we'll see more of that here um, multiple dives in a short period of time result in a buildup of that nitrogen meaning the patient has less time to be underwater and takes more time to decompress um, <clears throat> So what do we want to do when we're assessing patients with diving emergencies? When did you start having this problem? Did the problem start as you were diving down? Okay, that, that would indicate maybe they had uh, air trapped somewhere in their body that was being compressed, like, you know, in their eardrums or something. Did the problem happen when you were at the bottom? You know, maybe they were having a medical issue. Maybe there was something wrong with the gas they were breathing in their air tank. <clears throat> there have been concerns or co circumstances where the air tanks were, the their scuba tanks were filled with gas powered generators and they accidentally filled it with carbon monoxide and so the patient suffered from carbon monoxide poisoning while scuba diving <clears throat> what types of tanks what types of equipment were they using less important um honestly in big scheme of things as a paramedic that's not going to be near as much of a concern and let what you're looking for is hey were you using normal air or were you using some kind of uh, nitrox or trimix or some ab um, unusual or different mixture of air? And then, you know, where were you scuba diving? What was the water temperature? And um, how long were you underwater? How many dives did you have in the last 72 hours? The dives become an issue, um, like I said, as they start to build up nitrogen in their blood, they need longer decompression time. Um, what you're trying to do is find out, did they follow a decompression schedule? Um, a responsible, safe diver will have all of that logged and charted. It's going to be pretty easy for them to come up with that. An irresponsible diver or inexperienced diver may not have that info. And the concern here is if the patient can't tell you what their depths were, how long they were in the bottom, how long their surface intervals are, then you've got a concern that they don't have that. It wasn't properly controlled. It wasn't properly maintained. And you're at a much greater risk of a uh, <clears throat> decompression sickness or something like that. So a lot of modern diver, you know, current divers are using uh, calculators, uh, dive computers that really make it easy for them to track that information. It used to be much more uh, hands-on, lots of math to figure it out. Fortunately, we don't have to see that very much anymore. It's a lot easier for divers to keep track of their um, diving uh, conditions. So, um, so, yeah, you know, did they decompress during their uh, surface? Did they have problems with the dive? Um, what did they do after diving? People who drink a lot of alcohol prior to diving, I mean, you should never do that, but that increases their risk. People who um, scuba dive and then go on an airplane a quick shortly after um, diving, that can be a big risk, um, especially if the patient, you know, let's say they were down in the Keys, uh, they go scuba diving, then they go straight to the airport, jump on a plane and fly back to their home in Denver. Big problem because you just went from scuba diving to, you know, 10,000 feet above sea level in a matter of you know, less than 24 hours, that's going to, you're going to be dealing with decompression sickness issues. All right. So now we're going to start getting into some of the specific in, uh, issues and concerns related to diving, moving away from just general information on it. So with that, we're going to take a break for lunch and plan to come back uh, in an hour. All right, so getting back into diving injuries. So 
this is going to break the category or break them into categories of at what point in time the injury took place or, or the problem presented, <clears throat> mostly at depth um, while surf resurfacing or once they have resurfaced. All right, nitrogen narcosis, also known as the bend. Uh, excuse me, no, that's not the bends. My bad. Nitrogen narcosis. This is basically uh, nitrogen poisoning. <clears throat> Um, once, the, as you can see here, above three atmospheres, which that would be just oh, about 60, over 66 feet, where, um, <clears throat> because 33 would be one atmosphere, uh, 60, excuse me, 33 would be two atmospheres, 66 would be three atmospheres. So anytime after you get below that 3.2, and it doesn't normally happen at that depth, it's generally a lot deeper. Uh, you know, you were pushing 200 feet and stuff like that. But once you get down there below that, the nitrogen starts pumping into your blood or dissolving into your blood at a much higher concentration. And it creates an amnesic, or not amnesic, anesthetic effect where your um, it's hallucinant hallucinogenic there is a portion or a, a certain aspect of it that's very euphoric um if you may have maybe heard the term rapture of the deep before um <clears throat> basically it causes the diver to lose their uh uh, rational um, thought and they will continue to dive deeper and deeper um, they will do some really crazy stuff it's kind of like the equivalent of severe um, hypothermia and how it starts to affect the brain oh yeah 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 I'm sorry there you go <clears throat> alright so yeah uh, some of the uh, uh, documents, uh, you know, documentation I've read about people who have suffered from it or observed other people suffering from it. You know, crazy things like taking their regulator out and giving it to a fish, um, and uh, just stuff like that, uh, where they start to act really weird. Um, the big issue with uh, rapture of the deep nitrogen narcosis is uh, the patients never come back up. Um, they, well, I mean, they float up eventually, but they'll drown at depth. Um, this is one of the reasons scuba diving should always done, be done in pairs. You should never be scuba diving alone. That way, if you start to act weird, your partner uh, can pull you back up, um, keep an eye on you. But um, the big issue an, or another issue related to this is if the diver realizes this is happening, that they are having nitrogen narcosis, they will often panic, um, part of the irrational thought, and they will surface immediately. And um, that is very da dangerous and will lead to another condition that we'll see in a little bit called the bends. <clears throat> so what do we do? Well, <clears throat> The diver has to handle this themselves. They'll do a controlled ascent. They'll use um, mixed gases that have other gases or not as much nitrogen in it. Uh, this is where some of your nitrox diving or some of your uh, trimix diving where they uh, go to a um, that different mixture and they'll go to much deeper depths. Uh, you'll see that with industrial or commercial diving, you know, like on oil rigs and stuff like that. Um, for us, it's a matter of um, sedating them, oxygenating them, and such like that. Um, a lot of times, we'll end up having to put them in another um, hyperbaric chamber and uh, dive them to the same depth and then bring them up slowly. And by bringing them up, I mean by lowering the pressure in the hyperbaric chamber. All right, so um, barotrauma. This is another issue that can happen both going down or coming up. It doesn't normally happen at depth simply because the divers are generally pretty stable at that, you know, pressures and all that are stable. But anything that has gas filled in the body, whether it's the lungs, the eardrums, um, <clears throat> part of the GI tract or anything like that, anything that has gas in it can be compressed or burst. Um, if the, uh, so like, for example, if there's pressure in the, behind the ears and you're not equalizing your ears properly, your eardrums will be burst on the way down. But then if you don't equalize again on the way back up, they could be burst, they could burst on the way up. The lungs 
Uh, bursting on the way up is the big concern. Um, scuba divers are trained to always exhale, to never inhale while uh, mo uh, moving up by surfacing. Always exhale. Uh, if they're not moving, they can inhale and exhale, but if they're moving up, they should only be exhaling, and that is to allow the air to escape out of their lungs. Um, all right. Um, yeah. So most of the time when you're dealing with ear pain, uh, ear pressure, sinus pressure, it's very painful but it's not an emergency and not a big issue the biggest issue is this freaks this diver out and they um do something stupid uh, otherwise you're ish you're dealing with uh, pneumothoraxes and then we treat those like any other pneumothorax all right well there you go pneumothorax pulmonary overpressurization syndrome <coughs> they uh had to give it a fancy name but uh you pop a lung pneumothorax could be mediastinal or subcutaneous emphysema but um and in some cases you can get air gas embolisms this is where um air or large quantities of air have moved into the bloodstream forming a embolism of some sort it could be a pulmonary embolism or cerebral embolism or coronary embolism for those, you lay the patient on their left side with their feet up, and you put them on high flow O2. Otherwise, you treat pneumothorax as the same as you would a traumatic uh, pneumothorax. All right. Um, <clears throat> asthma, COPD, history of ARDS, things like that will definitely put the patient at greater risk. In fact, a lot of patients who have a history of asthma and COPD are, COPD are encouraged not to go scuba diving um, because of that risk. Um, but it, yeah, it, it's, you treat it like it's a pneumo. It's not much. Uh, uh, yeah. Oops, excuse me. All right, arterial gas embolisms or air gas embolisms when uh, air, large quantities of air is moved into the blood. This can happen when we're scuba diving because the regulator um, is pressurizing air into the uh, lungs, into the airway. And so if a blood vessel in the lungs is ruptured or torn, it can squeeze or force the air into the bloodstream that way. And that's how it can. Uh, get enough air in there to create the embolism. Generally, if it's originating in the lungs, it's not going to cause an embolism in the lungs. It's going to go into the heart or into the br brain. So, you know, heart attack or stroke symptoms are what you're going to see. <clears throat> um, here's your exa here's examples of what would happen. Uncontrolled ascent, patient not exhaling on um, <clears throat> uh, while um, ascending uh, and, and reason to believe that they may have a pneumothorax as well. I think these symptoms are all pretty consistent with what we would find for heart attack, stroke. Um, so, uh, hyperbaric chambers are what they're going to use. They can't go in with clot busters or anything like that because this isn't a blood clot. Um, they can't surgically remove it. What they'll do is they'll put uh, dive the patient in an hyperbaric chamber putting back down to pressure which will cause that gas to um, dissolve into their blood again and then slowly bring them back out so they can off gas so they can exhale that and uh, remove it basically squeezing those uh, gas bubbles that are causing the stroke or the heart attack down to where they're um, no longer exist the hyperbaric chamber is going to be the same treatment for your nitrogen narcosis and your um, the bends, which we'll see here in a little bit, which are related to, they're a form of gas embolism, but a little bit different. <clears throat>
of when dealing with a patient that you suspect has a gas embolism, do not put them in a helicopter or an aircraft of any type. The moving up in altitude in the atmosphere will cause the gas embolisms to expand, and so that will only complicate their condition worse. So uh, they should be ground transported only, even if it's going to take longer. <clears throat> All right, decompression sickness, also known as the bends. This is where you came uh, to the surface too quickly and nitrogen bubbles uh, boiled out. Just think of the CO2 bubbles coming out of a carbonated beverage. These nitrogen bubbles form in your blood and they cl get clog or, uh, clogged up or bunched up in various parts of your body. Um, <clears throat> Generally, you're going to see this in like some of the major muscle groups or in some of the joints. You might see it in the back, but it can affect other organs like the brain, the heart, the lungs, the liver, and things like that. But um, generally, it's nitrogen. Mm. That's the problem. It's avoided completely by exhaling or um, stopping while you return to the surface and having uh, decompression. It's called a decompression uh, break where they just sit there for you know two minutes. It depends on the dive. There's there's like the dive computer tells them how long that they have to sit there and exhale and just breathe in and out um, at that pressure at that depth. And then they'll go up another atmosphere and they'll sit there and they'll breathe in and out at that depth for a little while. And um, that's how they exhale um, all of that, remove all those gases from their body. So. Um, you can see here some of the risks. This is one of the ones, oops, I'll go back. This is why I said look out for patients who have been diving recently and then flew in an airplane because that increases the risk of decompression sickness. They'll end up um, cre having the decompression issues at altitude in the aircraft. Uh, so your patient, you know, they just flew back from Miami kind of a thing. Um, <clears throat> all right. Um, what is it going to look like? Well, um, it is basic. It is most commonly presented by pain, severe pain, maybe in the joints or the back or something like that. Um, it can, as you see, it can lead to neurologic symptoms. Um, so, type one: musculoskeletal pain, lymphatic pain, um, skin issues like that. Um, Here's all uh, edema is very rare, um, but look for that joint pain, mottled skin, fatigue, weakness, that kind of thing. Type two, this is when it's starting to uh, affect some of the central organs. So they're going to have um, stroke-like symptoms, heart attack type symptoms, pulmonary embolism type symptoms. It's it's the same as we saw before with the air gas embolism. It just came from a different origin. There's no other associated trauma with this. This one, I think, is the one you're going to be the most concerned about, especially when you don't live where the people were doing the scuba diving. So oxygen and then take them to a hyperbaric um, facility. We'll see here in a minute. There's a phone number that you can call or you had honestly have dispatch call and a range is called the Dive Alert Network or DAN. It's kind of like a poison control number. You call them, you tell them where you are, you tell them what you have. They'll have some questions about the dive, but then they will uh, direct you first in what medical care you need to provide in and out, but then they will let you know where the closest hyperbaric facility that will accept the patient is. And they have pre-arrangements for those uh, with those facilities, and it's all over the country. So, um, yeah, uh, use the... Uh, use that resource and we'll see that in a little bit all right um i think we understand hyperbaric we've mentioned this several times it increases the atmosphere causing a higher level of oxygen but or compresses the gases that are already in your um bloodstream um so all of these types of conditions you would use that the air gas embolism the decompression sickness carbon monoxide um and then it can also be used for wound care A, um, a uh, hyperbaric chamber can be as small as, uh, let's see, where is the picture? That, you know, a single uh, enough room for one person to lay on a bed in it, or it can be the size of an entire room. Um, commercial dive ships, a lot of the military um, dive ships and all that, they have uh, full rooms that are um, 
hyperbaric chambers. So um, in which in those cases, the uh, healthcare workers can actually dive with the patient. So if you have a sick patient, they'll put them on a bed in there, and then the healthcare workers will stay in that chamber during the uh, process to provide care. And they have get um, they have airlocks, so um, equipment, met food, um, such like that can be passed in and out. Um, through the airlock without having to uh, change the pressure in the room. Chris? Yes. So, um, the big focus there is the saturation of the tissue with oxygen. One of the issues with wound care is the uh, lack of vascular ac um, vascularization, do, um, the tissue not getting adequate blood flow because so many vessels were damaged in the swelling and all that, and with the original trauma. And so what hyperbaric uh, treatments will do is it will force oxygen into the skin without it having to f um, flow through the blood. And so it basically oxygenates the skin without um, the lungs. And um, that will uh, help restore the tissue uh, growth and help and provide for tissue growth uh, faster because of the increased um, oxygen, if that, if that makes sense. Um, I... I've read about that before. I know uh, it's been used uh, in a number of different things. Um, there was a, if you might remember back in the early 90s, there was a case in Texas where a toddler fell down a well pipe and got stuck and they had to uh, dig down beside the well uh, pipe and get her. It was a very complicated, it was like all over the national news. Um, I don't know, the, the CIA was probably toppling some government, and that's why they were trying to distract us. But anyway, the um, the little kid, um, she was in pretty rough shape. Like, her, um, she, her arms and legs were completely uh, black with necrosis when they got her out. It, 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 it was hours and hours. It was like this like eighteen hour process getting her out of there or something like that. And she had had a lack of blood flow for so long that um in air, there were areas where it looked like gangrene was already setting in. And a uh, doctor um suggested that look, we don't we don't know what else to do. We're looking at amputating this baby's um all four of this baby's extremities in order to save their life. Um before we do that, let's let's try this hyperbaric idea. He basically is like, I was doing some research, I've done some reading, and it looks like I think that this could work. They put the kid in the in the hyperbaric chamber, and she ended up having part of one of her toes amputated. Was all that had to be removed because it was so effective at restoring uh, the tissue. Um, and now it's a pretty common process uh, for a wound care. Um, I think it was one of those things. It was just like, what does hyperbarics do? And then what does wound, um, what's the wound process, uh, healing and uh, degradation process? And the doctor kind of like said, well, if this does this and that causes that, maybe if we use it together, it'll fix it. Try it. I mean, I, I know another doctor, I met another doctor one time who treat. well, I'll get to that later. We'll, we'll talk about that later anyway. Never mind. <clears throat> All right. Uh, some of the risks associated with this is, should not be taken lightly. All right. Um, all right. So other gas related. Um, not going to get too heavy on this one. This is basically the patient has exposure to uh, toxic gases or something like that. You know, maybe oxygen toxicity. They had too much oxygen because they were breathing too high a percentage of oxygen at too deep of a depth. If you may have heard of a um, a rebreather, um, they were popularized with the Navy SEALs stories, but they're basically you're breathing 100% oxygen, inhale, exhale, scrubs the CO2 out of the gas, and you just keep breathing that. That way you can breathe the same, um, the, you're breathing the same air over and over again. No gas air, bubbles are being released. Um, 
So there's a covert aspect to that. But they have a very limited depth because if you start going down, I think it's below two, um, uh, below, I think it is three atmospheres, the oxygen concentrations in your blood are so high that you can have oxygen poisoning from it. And so um, the less common issue with uh, recreational divers, but um, anyway, so <clears throat> these are some of the things that you're going to look for and it's um, going to be indicated that, hey, maybe their gas levels are off. Um, uh, all right. Um, these are problems that arose during their ascent. The patient was on their way back up. They were moving too quickly. Um, whenever they have a problem at depth, like they had a seizure or some emergency, the, the reaction is going to be to try to surface as fast as possible, but that's going to leave, lead to the decompression sickness and such like that. So, um, if it's an air, if it's contaminated or toxic gases, they're going to have the symptoms really soon. They'll see the symptoms on the way down. It won't take long. If it's a uh, breathing the wrong mixture of air to the wrong depth, so it's like a nitrogen issue or an oxygen toxicity, that's going to happen while they were down and had been at the um, at depth for a period of time. Care is going to be supportive. There's generally not a lot of trauma or other concerns here. All right, shallow water blackout. This is um, accomplished by idiots, um, uh, namely middle and high school boys, uh, middle school and high school boys, who want to have competitions on how long they can hold their breath underwater. And they get the idea that they, they get enough information out of middle school uh, A and P that says, oh, we have to breathe because CO2 is in our blood. So if I, ex if I hyperventilate and exhale all that CO2, there won't be any CO2 and I'll hold my breath longer. And in the theory, that'll work. They'll sit there, exhale all the CO2 out. They'll stick their head underwater. They'll start holding their breath. But then they'll be, you know, under the pool, you know, sitting on the bottom of the pool or something like that. And they're under a greater atmospheric pressure, which means more oxygen is being forced into their blood from the 21% oxygen that was in their lungs. So they can breathe that oxygen longer and feel okay longer. <coughs> Ultimately, the pressure will build or the CO2 levels will return. They'll have to come up for air and they'll start to exhale. Well, they'll come up to the surface and now they have surface water pressure or surface air pressure and decreased oxygen in their lungs. And it's now not enough oxygen. And so before they can breathe in enough oxygen, they actually pass out from hypoxia and um, this causes, this is called shallow water blackout, and they can often happen while they're still underwater and um, is one of the concerns that will lead to drowning, especially um, in that age range, middle school to high school air um, range. So there you go, shallow water blackout. <clears throat> Somebody passes out at a swimming pool, <clears throat> start asking these questions. What were you guys doing? What were you trying to do? The nice thing is, basically, there's very little long-term problem. <clears throat> they once they get, as long as they don't pass out and stay underwater, they're you know able to breathe. They breathe, everything's fine. Everything goes back to normal. But um, the big concern is if there's a risk of drowning. <clears throat> All right, so this is the Dan uh, Dive Alert Network. Um, this is a phone number. I said, don't worry about trying to call that number yourself. I think the best plan is to have dispatch call it and then have them link to it. Tell them, hey, look, Google it, look it up, call the Dive Alert Network, um, get me connected with them, and they will explain to you how you tell them what you got. They'll give you the questions you need to ask. Um, they'll help you uh, decide on what the best pre-hospital care is, and then they'll help you um, arranged transport or arranged acceptance at a hyperbaric facility. <clears throat> All right, so that's diving, and now we're going to move into um, altitude. So let's take a quick break. 
Altitude illnesses are not normally going to be seen um, below 5,000 feet. Honestly, though, it's going to be more like nine to 10,000 feet before you start to see the issue. Um, this is an atmospheric pressure above um, that uh, 5,000 feet above sea level or um, 10,000 feet or so. The uh, reason that we don't have these issues in aircraft are twofold. Uh, aircraft cabins are pressurized to about 8,000 feet of altitude. So just below the typical nine to 10,000 where the problem is uh, starts and the patient has to be at that altitude for an extended period of time. So we're looking at like nine, 10, nine, 12, 24 hours kind of a thing. Jo doing a short air aircraft, uh, ride an aircraft, not normally going to cause a problem for them. The reason that this is a what happens in these cases is there's a low pressure, hypobaric. As the as you go up into the atmosphere, even though we're only talking like you know ten thousand feet, there is a reduction in atmospheric pressure, which means the partial pressure of oxygen goes down. This could be equivalent to breathing oxygen at a lower percentage, even at sea level. And so, well. At sea level, we might say that on our concentration of oxygen of 19.5% or less is considered IDLH, uh, or, you know, low oxygen levels. Well, you start going up in altitude, the same thing happens. You have low oxygen levels. Um, but it's the percentage of oxygen has not changed, but the pressure that it exerts on your blood does. And so that's where your problem comes from. <clears throat> So, um, this is why um, a lot of aircraft that go, uh, that have non pressurized, well, this is why all aircraft that have non pressurized cabins have to carry oxygen masks and all that for the crew. Because, and why, um, if you're in a commercial airline with a pressurized cabin, they're like, in the event of a cabin decompression uh, scenario, you know, masks fall out of the ceiling. Well, those masks only hold about like two liters of oxygen at a time. They're not a non rebreather. They're not going to have 15 liters of oxygen. It's just going to be enough to supplement the um, oxygen at, you know, 30,000 feet or whatever the aircraft is at. So that's how that, uh, that's, that's the function there. All right. So, um, yeah, don't need to worry about that part. Okay. Um, so here's your three types of altitude sickness. You have acute mountain sickness and then haste and hate. <clears throat> So there's that, just kind of the stuff I already said, anything above 8,000 feet. Um, it can happen lower than that, but typically is not normally a concern. Um, the big issue here is how fast or how slow the person uh, ascended that altitude. You know, you get in a car and you drive up to the top of a mountain. Um, that might be a big issue. You fly airplane up to the top of the mountain. That's going to be a problem. You know, think like out in Colorado where there, you know, you have a, 10,000, 12,000 foot mountain, you'd be driving over it. Um, go up over the top of it and back down, no problem, because you've only been there at that altitude for a period of time. You drive straight to the top of the mountain and sit there for a little while, well, you might have an issue. Um, so uh, if you've ever done any research or looked into like people who want to climb Everest or any of those crazy big mountains, You'll notice that they don't just like show up, climb to the top of the mountain, climb back down, call it a day, you know, and spend like a few nights on the mountain. No, it's like a multiple week process where they go to different altitudes along the way at different camps, and then they stay there for a week and acclimate to that pressure and then go up to the next one, acclimate at that pressure. And all of this is done in an effort to build up their red blood cell quantities, um, and they'll also have to carry oxygen with them so that if they start getting winded, they can, you know, breathe some oxygen at uh, those various altitudes. Um, all right. So what do we do when we have lower oxygen pressures? Well, we start hyperventilating, breathing faster, trying to maintain oxygen. What's that do? We exhale CO2 faster, not not helpful, but can cause lightheadedness, can cause a dizziness, just like we can see the 
with the uh, panic attack patients. Um, and then you get the respiratory alkalosis. You, um, <clears throat> in later cases, this can cause a change of um, your osmotic pressures because it creates that metabolic acidosis in the blood and it starts to change the uh, pressures in your um the osmotic pressures and it'll start pushing fluid out of your bloodstream into your cells and this is a particular problem in both the brain in the brain and in the lungs and that's that's where we see the issues predominantly at early you know so here you can see um high altitude pulmonary edema your patient is going to have fluid in the lungs they'll have a cough they'll be short of breath uh, you'll hear rails ronchi or something like that you do not treat these patients with nitroglycerin lasix or anything like you would for a chf -er. uh, what they need cpap is a good idea because that increases the pressure uh, supplemental oxygen is generally pretty effective for these people so um another option Excuse me. Another option, if for these patients, is to put them in what's called, uh, or in like a hyperbaric tent, where it's just basically an inflatable. Think of it like an air mattress that they can get inside, and then they just fill it up to a higher pressure. It's not. We're not talking crazy pressures like in a hyperbaric scuba diving tank or chamber, but it's just a few psi more than the atmosphere outside, and that is enough to create the um and it and it doesn't have to be um the pressure the air doesn't have to be oxygen or anything it's just atmospheric air put under a higher pressure and so that's um a quick easy way to do it uh, a lot of times they'll carry tents that they can um seal up like that and then use like an um pump from like an air mattress pump type thing to pump up the tent so history of it being obese, getting to the altitude too quickly, living below 3,000 feet at that lower altitude. So what, what's it going to look like? Well, mountain sickness, headache, fatigue. Uh, they may have some nausea, vomiting. They may have diarrhea. The headache and the nausea, uh, nausea vomiting are kind of your biggest uh, indicators. Uh, dizziness may happen. The rest of those, it's like, eh, it, what what's causing it? But they can all be associated. So but your headaches and your vomiting those are kind of the ones you really look for how do we treat it well they take their time you know re reduce exertion rest um stay at that altitude for a few days acclimate or if necessary if it's not working or not possible get them back down to a lower altitude and um the symptoms should clear up pretty quickly while the supplemental oxygen obviously would help you could do that it doesn't really fix the problem because um you know they're probably not going to want to sit there hooked to an oxygen tank the entire time they're wherever they are all right so take the symptoms of acute mountain sickness add in the cough the difficulty breathing at rest and tightness or congestion in the chest you might hear rails or ronchi the wheezing basically now you're hearing lung specific symptoms that's what it's all it takes to make it a high altitude pulmonary edema so um, mountain sickness, no neurologic, no respiratory symptoms, just GI headache, you know, dizziness. HAPE, you have the respiratory conditions, and then HACE, here's your getting altered mental status. Um, maybe they're acting like they're having a stroke or they're um, inebriated or something like that. And so you'll you'll see that lack of coordination and such um, presenting with the high altitude cerebral edema. All right, so what might indicate that this is not HAPE or HACE? Well, if the patient um, was at altitude for four or more days before they had the symptoms, it's probably not the altitude. The altitude is supposed to start within that first 24 hours, altitude issues. If they never had a headache prior to these other symptoms starting, you know, if they didn't have the mountain sickness symptoms before the altitude symptoms, the, or the uh, respiratory or cerebral issues, then it wasn't a mountain sickness or it wasn't altitude related. It may be just normal stroke or some other 
a common respiratory issue. So if it doesn't get better when they go back down below 8,000 feet, then that's another indication that this is not altitude related. All right. Um, All right, so only increasing your elevation by 1,000 feet a day, so basically slowly climbing the mountain. That can be useful um, waiting. Um, <clears throat> the acetazolamide, one of the things that that's going to do is help them produce more red blood cells. By having a higher hemoglobin and red blood cell count, they'll be able to carry oxygen more efficiently. Um, so this shouldn't be confused with the patients who have uh, polycythemia, like your COPD patients, where they have chronically a higher hemoglobin and red blood cell count. They have that because they can't absorb enough oxygen. That patient then goes to an altitude. They're actually going to have a much harder time breathing because now there's not as much oxygen being absorbed or um, uh, pressurized into their body, and they have a decreased ability to absorb it. So they're really going to struggle at altitude. So this is all symptom treatment. You know, oxygen, headache. Uh, treat the headache with aspirin, uh, Tylenol, uh, nausea with fenugreek or Zofran, kind of a thing. All right, um, pulmonary edema, cerebral edema. This you're going to treat pretty aggressively. You want to get them off the mountain, get them off that altitude as quickly as you can. Oxygen um, should help during the descent. Um, <clears throat> and this is where I said earlier, you can also use um, those tents, the pressurized tents. The steroids here, the dexamethasone, that'll help reduce that inflammation, that fluid shifting, and so that will um, slow the haste. Of course, once you're talking about haste, the high altitude cerebral edema, you're looking at like stroke-like stroke -like conditions where you could deal with severe brain um, damage. So you want to treat that aggressively. Unlike with scuba diving, the speed of descent, speed of getting down the mountain does not matter. You want to, or there's no concern about going too fast. Get off that mount, get them off that altitude. All right. So this is the portable hyperbaric chamber I was talking about. <clears throat> All right. So, <coughs> excuse me. Mm, that felt helpful. <clears throat> That felt effective. All right, so um, what, uh, any questions, uh, experiences, or anything like that with altitude sicknesses, altitude problems? Nothing? All right, lightning strike patients. Um, as you can see, not very many happen every year, or at least not very many deaths happen from them each year. Um, with proper EMS care, uh, it's actually pretty easy to get somebody to survive a lightning strike. Um, the current is not the same as we would see with uh, uh, commercial or you know ACDC current that we see at our house or on batteries or something like that. Um, this is a very rapid, yes, it's a high energy, but it's a very short duration of exposure. Um, most of the time, because the human body really isn't the greatest conductor, and we're talking about such crazy um, voltage, high levels of voltage, the lightning strike doesn't pass through the patient, it passes around the patient, kind of like surrounds them. And so um, it's one of the reasons we don't see as much injury from lightning strikes as we would have expected. Uh, splash injuries, this is where like the lightning strikes an object close to the patient and then one of the uh, bolts reaches out and hits you know, some energy from that strike 
then hits the patient. And so it's a lower voltage, and then that'll tend to go through, the actually pass through the patient versus going around the patient. Um, you can deal with burns. Um, <clears throat> you may deal with uh, kind of like the... You could deal with the electrocution or electrical injuries that we talked about in the trauma unit where, you know, you have the um, entrance wounds and the exit wounds. But uh, another thing is they may be um, uh, like splinters. Like if it hits a tree and the tree explodes and splinters get in their eye or something along those lines. Um, it will or it can lead to a complete depolarization of their muscles. So they're, you know, the muscles cramp, their diaphragm will cramp, their heart will go to depolarization. You know, every, fi every cell will fire simultaneously. This will, um, and, but because of the automaticity of the heart, it's very common for the heart to then start beating again on its own. And you're like everything depolarized, just like if you defibrillated them and then the SA node takes over and starts up in the heart and beats normal. The problem is the diaphragm does not have that automaticity. So if the diaphragm depolarizes and goes into that contracted position and nothing tells it, to sends a signal again, it, um, it may, they may not start breathing. So while their heart starts beating again, they don't start breathing again. This will lead to hypoxia and a secondary cardiac arrest. So they're, you know, their heart depolarized, started beating again, but then they go into a hypoxic state and go back to cardiac arrest. For this reason, when we treat patients with lightning strike injuries, we reverse triage. When you arrive on scene, a situation with multiple lightning strike victims, you always find the ones in the worst case condition first, you know, the people who are in cardiac arrest. You defibrillate them, you ventilate them, problem generally will resolve. If the patient is conscious and has, or has breathing and has a pulse upon arrival, they're probably going to keep it. There's, a, there's very little reason to believe that they'll lose that. So we reverse triage on light, multiple victim lightning strikes. Now, could they have problems? Yeah, there's very good chance that they could have conductive issues with their heart or neurologic issues long term. It doesn't mean they have to be fatal. Uh, as you can see, 75% could. Now, this is an interesting short term condition that's a result of the lightning strike, the Lichtenberg uh, figure. Uh, this is caused by the ion wash, by the ions as the energy passes over the skin. Um, you may have seen a pattern like this formed with wood burning where they um, wet wood and create a electrical flow through the wood and it burns um, this lightning fingering pattern, feathering pattern. Well, this is not a, this is a ion burn. So it kind of think of it like a first degree burn or a sunburn or something like that in that pattern that way. Um, there, of course, other forms of trauma I've already kind of mentioned may be present as well. Um, all right, so I already mentioned reverse triage. Um, everybody who is struck by lightning should be transported to a medical facility unless they have this. Uh, if they have Lichtenberg uh, figures, then you want to transport them directly to a tattoo parlor because I guarantee you if I ever get struck by lightning and have that pattern from the lightning strike, I'm getting that son of a gun tattooed uh, because that is cool as Christmas in my opinion. And nobody's paying any attention to me. So oh, why do we do reverse triage? Tell me. Okay. But we Yep. Yep. What is the primary cause of cardiac arrest post lightning strike? Somebody else. Ashley, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Conyers, you guys are being quiet over there today. What is primary cause of cardiac arrest post lightning strike?
Right, but what does the heart do after that? What's that? Yeah, the heart, it's going to reset and start on its own. So what leads to the cardiac arrest, though? It's the paralysis of the diaphragm. The diaphragm is paralyzed, you know, de uh, depolarizes because it's a muscle, but then doesn't start contracting stop, um, and receiving the nerve sick impulse again from the brain. So the real concern is if the diaphragm um, <coughs> uh, is more or less paralyzed. Um, and so their cardiac arrest is going to be secondary to that hypoxia. All right, questions about lightning strikes. Of course, scene safety, make sure you're, um, if you're responding to a lightning strike, that there, you're not placing yourself in a situation where you're also going to be struck by lightning. Um, you stay in the vehicle, stay away from tall structures, uh, or at least don't be near the tallest structure in the area. Being in a vehicle is generally the safest situation because the rubber tires uh, insulate and separate the vehicle from the ground. Vehicles can be struck by lightning, but the energy tends to flow through the vehicle and not into you as a um, passenger. So that's another reason um, that you want to avoid uh, or you know stay in vehicles during a um, lightning storm. Experience I've had a lightning strike. Uh, the lady was getting out of the car, getting thunderstorming, and she popped her umbrella out first. The lightning struck the umbrella. Whew. We traveled you know, through the car, through the car beside her, the car beside her. We got there. Oh my goodness. I have had one lightning strike patient. She was out for a walk in her neighborhood. There were storms in the area. Um, she was hurrying home. She was trying to get home because of the um, storms were coming. And the lightning struck a pine tree near her. Um, her only complaint was her eye hurt. Uh, she had pain in her eye. She thought that she had a... Um, splinters because the tree you know the bolt hit ran down that pine tree and just exploded bark and uh wood out the side all the way to the ground mud everywhere and so she thought she had like mud or splinters or something in her eye because it exploded into her face well you know i looked at it i couldn't uh, i could see redness in her eye a red spot couldn't see any uh foreign object so we took her to the hospital Cardiac monitor was great. Upon further, I don't want to say, like examination, they found a red burn mark on the bottom of her foot. And it was determined that she had had a side splash injury and that the bolt had entered through her eyeball and come out her foot. <clears throat> so she was extremely lucky. Um, my understanding, I didn't, I didn't follow up. It was all over the news, but my understanding was no. All right. So envenomations, bites and stings. This is not, like I said, these are not related specifically to a, um, um, allergic reaction. We're looking more towards the actual, uh, toxins uh, or venom created by the animal uh, and its effect on our body. So a number of different uh, animals, um, organisms can cause these problems. As you can see, we have the Hemoptera, we have the Elapidae and Crotalae families of snakes, and then we have your um, these three spiders that exist in the uh, U.S., and then scorpions. And there's actually only one, and it's called the bark scorpion. Um, here 
in the United States, native to the U.S. Now, I shouldn't say native because, you know, people import exotic animals all the time. But native to the U.S., the on, these are the only spiders and scorpions that are, um, and the snakes that are going to be venomous to us. And that's that's all we're looking at is what is native to the U.S. Um, so... <clears throat> Obviously, you treat the anaphylaxis as we would. We've already learned about that, so moving on from that. Do not enter these scenes unless you know it is safe. Um, these these mofos give me the heebie-jeebies. Um, I'm not a fan here uh, of these guys. All right. Um, so we're familiar with the uh, in site of injection. You get the swelling, you get the uh, rash, you get the um, redness, uh, the itching. Um, and that's what you see, like the pain from a fire ant bite and stuff like that. Most of the time, not a big issue. However, if enough venom is injected, it can be a problem. Um, but for most humans, it's the anaphylaxis that's the issue for wasps, bees, and things like that. Um, while infection is possible, it's not that common unless they continue to scratch it or pick at it. Um, most of the time, unless they're having anaphylaxis or some kind of allergic reaction, there's no reason to transport these patients. Uh, Warm, moist poultices help uh, soothe it. Uh, you know, you may have heard the mixing um, Adolph's meat tenderizer with some water, but frankly, mud does this a very similar process. It's soothing and drawing. Um, now, there's the old school uh, idea of using tobacco, uh, uh, chewing tobacco on it. The um, you could do the same thing with cigarette tobacco that's been moistened um, and applied to it. The uh, idea here is the nicotine is numbing, um, and so that also helps uh, soothe it. But really, any type of ointment or lotion that's going to um, soothe the itch is really all you need for uh, bee stings and such. <laughs> um, Anti-inflammatories and antihistamines may be necessary with somebody who... <coughs> Excuse me. Antihistamines or anti-inflammatories like Tylenol and ibuprofen may be necessary for patients who have had an extreme amount of stings, but um, generally not something you need to get too worried about here. All right. Now, snake bites are a little bit different of a situation. Here in the United States, we have these two major uh, categories of venomous snakes. You have the Verapidae or uh, Crotalinae, and then you also have the uh, Elapidae. Uh, the Verapidae, those are going to be your pit vipers, and then your Elapidae are the coral snakes. Um, and they have two very distinctly different types of venom. The Verapidae are all going to have a hemolytic um, venom, whereas your uh, Elapidae, they're going to have a nerve toxin, a neurotoxin. Now, there are many, many other snakes in the world um, who will fall into those various categories. Um, but here, native to the U.S., that's what we're going to look at. And then, um, yeah. Of course, southeastern and southwestern U.S. are where you're going to see most of these snakes anyway. Pit vipers. These are going to be your rattlesnakes of any any species of rattlesnake, um, cottonmouth, um, and your copperheads. Um, th those are your pit vipers that you're going to see here in the U.S. So their venom is designed to stop blood from clotting as well as break down proteins. And so that's how they kill their small uh, rodent prey, uh, like mice and rabbits and such like that, and causing them to bleed and breaking down that protein in the red blood cells and breaks down their blood cells and um, causes death. There's another reason why the venom doesn't harm them when they eat it because they destroy that venom in their um, intestines. So, um, Tissue damage is a problem, bleeding is a big issue, and um, necrosis. We'll see a little bit more on that one here in a minute. Coral snakes are the only known elapidid, the only elapidid no known to be native to the United States. These are very, very small snakes, 
um, generally 12 to 18 inches long, so um, very thin. Um, they are reclusive. They like to hide under logs and wood piles and leaves. They're, they're not aggressive, um, and they do not have uh, fangs. Uh, but because their toxin is a neurotoxin, it can cause numbness, tingling, paralysis, could, depending on the high uh, dose, could cause respiratory and stroke like respiratory arrest or stroke like symptoms. So that is the issues there. But it's, but it's in fact quite unusual for you to find a severe uh, coral snake bite here in the U.S. So uh, pit vipers, you know the rattlesnakes, cottonmouth, copperhead, they have the vangs, uh, uh, fangs. The pits uh, we're referring to are those uh, right in front of their eyes there that. Um, are part of their sensation of heat uh, looking, they have these heat sensing pits, but their bites are almost always just two fang injection sites to um, <clears throat> where they reach out, they strike and hit with the two fangs. If you, you may or may not see the rest of these teeth marks that you can see there in the, in the tooth pattern. Um, oftentimes they don't bite down long enough and hard enough to get their, uh, other teeth to leave a mark, it's just the fang injection points that you look for. And of course, there could be one or two depending on how they uh, struck. Now, your um, elapidids, the um, coral snake, their classic uh, indicator is that double row of teeth. On a coral snake, that inner line of teeth, so you can see the two inner line there, the two lines of teeth on the inside, those are the ones that are venomous. Those are the ones that can inject the venom. But instead of striking and injecting a deep, um, deeply with their fangs, they are very shallow and they sit there and they kind of like gnaw on the skin. And because they're so small, typically, they have to get to a part of your body like between the fingers or something like that. Um, between the toes um, in order to actually get enough tissue for them to chew through. Um, their fangs are not very long. They're, they're very short teeth. So if they were to bite the side of your finger, our fingers tend to be callous enough. Now, obviously, if it was a baby, a child or whatever, the very different story, they have a very thin skin. But most people's uh, fingers and hands tend to be callous enough that they're not going to be able to get through the um skin to actually inject any venom and their mouth is generally not large enough to get around like your arm or your ankle or something like that to actually be able to bite down. Most coral snake bites can be easily avoided by wearing lightweight gloves, even cotton gloves, while doing uh, lawn work and yard work. That's where you're going to see these. They're not going to like come jumping out from under a tree at somebody and striking. No. Cotton mouths, copperheads, uh, rattlesnakes, different story. They will. They will strike uh, very quickly. Even though they don't normally um, pursue uh, copperheads and cottonmouths will. They're very aggressive. Most rattlesnakes are not actually that aggressive and would rather run away from you simply because they know they're not going to eat you. So there's no reason to attack you. They're only going to attack if they're threatened. So here's some pictures of our pit vipers, you know, the rattlesnake, and then on the top right, you have the copperhead, and then the bottom is the cottonmouth. You can see that very uh, classic white chin on the uh, cottonmouth, which is going to be found more near um, lake swamps, rivers, stuff like that. That's why it's called a water moccasin. All right, another point on our, oh, well, I think we'll get to that in a minute. I already kind of explained the snakes. Here's that um, picture of coral snake. As you can see, it's a rather small snake. Um, here's the nomen or the adage on this. Red against yellow kills the fellow. And red against black is a friend of Jack or Venom Lack. You know, I grew up in Florida, so we had to watch out for these a lot. Notice how this has red, yellow, black, yellow, red, yellow, black, yellow. The black and the yellow are touching, but the red and the yellow are touching. The black never touches the red. That's a coral snake. If the but if the black and the red are touching each other, that's either a king snake or a milk snake. And these sna king and milk snakes can look very similar to coral snakes, uh, but actually a lot bigger, um, but they're non-venomous. Um, so if the red and the yellow are touching, it is a coral snake. And they're very small and um, 
it can take quite a while for these symptoms to show up. All right. Make certain that the snake is no longer a risk or in danger. However, if it's possible to get a photo of the snake, or in some cases, it's actually possible to get the remains of the snake, it would be really important to do that, or it's very helpful to do that, so to positively identify the type of snake so that the appropriate antivenom can be ordered, especially if it's an exotic uh, snake. Um, dead snakes can bite. They do have a cadaver reaction. Um, so the, um, generally the better way to transport is decapitated and not that, and, and maybe just, um, in that case where it's just the head is removed kind of a thing. All right. Another thing to, uh, notice is he, here's how these venoms work, right? Podiolysis, hemolysis, thrombogenesis, they can't produce, um, it breaks down the red blood cells, it breaks down clots, they have proteins destroyed, tissue is destroyed. This is all from a pit viper. For that reason, it's really easy to tell if the bite is a wet bite or a dry bite um, on a pit viper. Not all snake bites actually invent, inject venom. Especially with your older mature snakes, they're looking at the human as a potential threat, but not as food. So they see no reason to inject inject you with venom because they are not going to kill you. They know they're not going to kill you and they know they're not going to eat you. They're just trying to scare you away. So if you look at the bite and you can see the the fang marks, you see the um injection sites, but they're dry. There's no blood, there's very little swelling, they're not, you know, they're not bleeding and didn't bleed. There's a really, really good chance that was a dry bite. On the other hand, young snakes, um, smaller ones, um, adolescent immature snakes, they're just like adolescent males. As soon as those fangs get in there, they're pumping that venom as fast as they can. So they're actually the most dangerous because they will, pump, they can't control um, the amount of venom they're uh, injecting, and they will inject a lot of venom. Um, so, <clears throat> and you'll see those wounds uh, bleeding. Um, there'll be a lot more pain on them and such like that. And so that's a good indication that you got a problem. So when the patient, oh, I got bit by a snake and there's like no bleeding, no swelling, no irritation around it. Uh, you treat it like it's a, any other scratch or cut, um, but there's almost no risk whatsoever of envenomation. Now on your elapidids, you know, how long did that coral, coral snake sit there gnaw? Where was it gnawing? Um, how much redness and irritation is there? You know, did it inject the venom? Them, and then the neurotoxins are going to take a, quite a while. You know, it can be several hours before they start having issues. So what can we do? Well, one of the big things to do is to reduce their act, their level of activity. You don't want their heart rate up. You don't want them breathing fast. You don't want them moving that extremity around because you don't want that venom going cent um, into their central circulation. <clears throat> So, clean the wound. Uh, the hospital is probably going to draw the blood. We probably aren't going to draw blood pre-hospital. Um, immobilize it so that it's not being moved around because the more you um, exercise that extremity, the more blood gets pumped in there. And we we want to avoid that. Um, constriction, there's a lot of question on that. Okay, that this is one of the tougher questions in some countries of the world the treatment is immediate tourniquet like full-on tourniquet stop the flow of blood and in some of those countries some of those situations you're dealing with snakes that have neurotoxins that will take you in minutes and so you do want a you want to risk the damage of a tourniquet to stop the problem. There are more recommendations around now of using like an IV tourniquet to stop as like a lymphatic tourniquet to and to slow venous return, but not to cut off uh, ar arterial blood flow. So you might try that, uh, the venous tourniquet, but follow your local protocols. But at this point, venous tourniquets are about all that we're going to use. Um, also, you might find that in other countries, the standard recommendation could be to um, shock, use an electric shock treatment, like a tr 
taser device of some sort um, wherever the injection is. Well, in some of your venoms, like some of your neurotoxin venoms, the um, the toxin is destroyed with the high voltage electricity. It's high volt, low amps, just like a taser. And so if you shock the wound, you can destroy most of the venom and it can be very helpful. Uh, <clears throat> that is not currently recommended here in the US, um, but it is used extensively in countries like Australia and uh, other Southeastern Asian, uh, South, yeah, Southeast Asian countries and such. All right, spider bites. There are three species of spiders that will present any form of concern to, to in the U.S., right, native to the U.S. While there are crazy numbers of spiders, there's only three species in the U.S. that we have to worry about, and that's the black widow, the brown recluse, and the hobo. Um, here in the southeast, it's the widow and the brown recluse. That's all we're going to see. The hobos are in the northwest. Um, but the hobos and the brown recluse look very, very similar. Uh, the hobo is just a bit more aggressive than the brown recluse. Um, here in the southeast, brown recluse and wolf spiders look a lot alike. Um, the difference is wolf spiders are non-venomous and are aggressive and will chase you across the room, whereas brown recluse are um, venomous and will hide from you. There's your black widow. The black widow has a neurotoxin. It likes dark, uh, quiet areas. Uh, you'll find it by reaching behind things in the shed. I mean, basically it's the same case for any of these spiders. They don't like to be out in the open where a f um, bird is gonna come along and uh, eat them. <clears throat> um, Easily, very, very short fangs, easily protected against um, by uh, light, even lightweight gloves. So um, the more common issue with spiders and scorpions is them getting inside of your boot or your glove without you knowing it, and then you putting your hand or foot into it and them um, getting mad at you. So here's your brown recluse, sometimes referred to the fiddleback, because you can see looking at, starting at its eyes and across its abdomen before you get to the tail, it has that shape, looks like a violin uh, with the scroll there at the base of the uh, tail. Um, I was bit by a uh, brown recluse when I was a teenager one time. It was on the side of my finger, very calloused area of my hand. The venom was only surface level. It did not uh, get to any of the deeper lower uh, levels of the tissue. Um, all the outer layers of my skin sloughed off. It was very red and inflamed, but it really didn't um, cause any significant issues. And that's one of the most common issues, uh, or that's kind of what we see with brown recluse bites. So. Um, all right, so if the, if it was a, um, black widow, black widows cause a very sudden sharp prick and maybe even burning feeling, um, from the bite, um, restlessness may follow brown recluse. You may not even know you were bitten. Uh, it tends to be a very numb or tingly feeling after a little while, but you often won't even realize you were, um, bit by the brown recluse. The black widow is a neurotoxin. So as you can see, 30 to 60 minutes onset of the toxins, muscle spasms, um, cramping, uh, diaphoresis. It can eventually cause um, paralysis of the diaphragm, but that's gonna be a really heavy dose that goes untreated and takes a while. So very uncommon for it to be fatal. Most of the time, symptom are you treat it symptomatically, you know, supportive care until the symptoms wear off. Uh, brown recluse bites, they are vasoconstrictors. Mm. What they do is it causes all the blood vessels in that tissue to constrict, reducing blood flow, leading to necrosis. And so it starts out as this kind of dry looking, dark, area, dark patch on the skin with the little bite mark in the middle. It's a very zoomed in picture. And then it slowly increases in size. Then it becomes necrotic and wet um, and starts to essentially rot from the middle out. This first, the upper picture is more like what my finger looked like, but it was just the outer layers of skin that sloughed off. It never got to this ne deeper necrotic layer because the venom didn't extend that, um, penetrate that deep. 
Um, I, I mentioned earlier, I actually met a, a, a plastic surgeon in Texas who um, treated brown recluse bites with nitroglycerin paste. Normally we think of nitro paste for CHF patients. She would place the nitroglycerin paste directly on the wound and just around the wound, causing a local vasodilation. And then it would increase blood flow to that tissue and reverse the problem without it becoming infected or requiring surgical debridement. Generally, if the wound goes untreated for any period of time, it will continue to necrose, it'll continue to spread, and it can lead to gangrene and require surgical um, excising of the wound. You have to like cut out all the dead tissue and stuff and could, if left untreated long enough, result in amputation. Uh, it's an extreme case. Most people get it treated far before... It, uh, well before that happens. So, Black Widow, ice packs to cool it, numb it, um, pain relief, muscle re spasm relief, so muscle relaxers might be necessary. Um, but most of the time, the antivenom is not used, only with the very uh, susceptible. But generally, you just maintain symptoms until it wears off. Um, so... All right, scorpions. There's only one scorpion in the U.S., the bark scorpion, that presents a threat to humans. Now, while there are a number of different scorpions and they all hurt when they sting you, the bark scorpion is the only one that has a venom that will cause you a problem. The others, you know, they hurt, but they're not really going to make you sick or anything like that. Just local reaction, kind of like a fire ant bite. <clears throat> But it can, but they are a neurotoxin. It can lead to paresthesia and cause nerve issues um, and breathing issues later on. But again, not very common. Um, we're not going to see them here in the southeast. These are in the southwest uh, desert areas, so we don't we don't really see them. We'll see other scorpions around here, but not the bark scorpions. They're not native to this part of the country. Again, most of it being a neurotoxin, you're just going to maintain vital signs, maintain breathing and all that. Once it wears off, everything's fine. The intubation would be necessary if the patient starts having difficulty breathing or diff uh, major nerve control. But again, probably not going to see that in the pre-hospital environment. They're talking about the constricting bands like the IV tourniquet. All right, we are not going to use these treatments in the field. These are in-hospital treatments. We're simply supporting ABCs in the field. All right, so tick bites. While ticks are not venomous, ticks are carriers of a lot of different diseases. Um, so Lyme's disease, Rocky, Spon Rocky Mountain spotted fever, these are the big ones that you have to worry about. Um, there's some other things that are, uh, they're starting to just refer to them as tick-borne illnesses. Um, there's some that are really uh, being noticed now or starting to present more frequently. And essentially they are autoimmune, not autoimmune, they are immune disorders that cause you the person to develop allergies to common substances and suddenly develop these, you know, like sensitivities to meat and such like that as a result of um, the tick-borne disease. Uh, how do, you know, here in Georgia, I feel like we should know how to remove ticks, so I'm really not going to talk about that. Um, just make sure you dispose of it correctly and that you clean the site afterwards. Um, yeah, most tick bites do not require transport. Even if they do get Lyme's disease or uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, there's nothing that needs to be done at the ER. This is follow-up at an urgent care follow-up with their primary care doctor. These are not things that um, can be treated emergently. Like The ER is not going to do anything for that. Um, remove the tick, clean it with soap and water, antiseptics, tell them to call a regular doctor or... Um, because even then, the urgent care is not. These treatments are long-term, slow treatments, um, so their primary care physician is the one to see about those. So, And I forgot that was all, that ticks were the last one. I thought there was something else after that. So that wraps our chapter on environmental emergencies. Do you guys have any questions on uh, the last section we covered?